Right now, everybody is talking about cryptocurrency, and the cyber criminals are hiding in the conversation. Cyber criminals use social engineering loaded with urgency and fear to successfully prey on your company, your employees, and your customers. Spear phishing is just one of 13 types of email threats. Barracuda has identified these 13 types and shows you how you can protect your company, your customers, and your reputation. Find out about the 13 email threat types and Barracuda email protection. Get your free ebook at securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. FlexTrack is the premier pen test reporting and collaboration platform, empowering your team to spend more time hacking and less time reporting. FlexTrack centralizes your data, streamlines tedious workflows, automates report building, and facilitates communication with stakeholders. To learn how you can achieve a 30% increase in efficiency, and cut report cycles by up to 65%, head to securityweekly.com forward slash PlexTrack. Claim your free month of PlexTrack and get your copy of the Writing a Killer Penetration Test Report Guide today. Welcome back everyone to Paul's Security Weekly. All of our hosts are still with us. Charles is still with us. We're gonna talk about the security news. I do wanna start with one that kinda, it segues off of some of the things we were talking about in the previous segment. My story number 12 is a journey to the dawn. Now, I, bear with me for a moment and also keep in mind that like I've been doing Unix and Linux for the better part of 20 years. And so just keep that in mind. So when I'm reading this blog post, I'm going to pull a quote from it. It says, um, technically this bug, CVE 2022-1786, is the first bug that I found, analyzed, exploited, and reported alone. This blog is written to commemorate this moment. Thus, this blog will not be in the style of what is the correct way to exploit a bug. Instead, it will document all the frustration and excitement in the crazy seven days that I spent developing the exploit. I hope you will enjoy the ride. I continued reading, and I started reading, and then he starts describing uh, kernel modules and system calls, and I was like, I don't understand that. And he's like, it's cool. If you don't understand that, go read this other these other two posts. I'm like, cool, all right. Let me go read that post. I start reading that post and I get through the first paragraph, which is like really cool, kind of setting it up. And then mm -hmm. it starts getting into system calls and modules in uh, in IO, IO underscore U ring is the kernel module or call that's basically uh -huh. like IO for network and storage to make it faster to do parallel uh, communications, which that I got. And then it started to lose me. And it's like, oh, if you really want to understand this IO underscore U ring, I believe it was, you got to go read this post. And then I started oh, reading yeah. that post. And I'm like, I, I need to do a lot more studying because I still, <laughs> I would have to spend. And by then you the forgot next, what like, the original large, question was. Yeah, large, so now I'm three articles, three or four articles deep into this. Deep. And yeah. I'm like, I need to bring on someone who's a Linux kernel developer that already knows this stuff to look at this stuff to explain it because I can't be an expert in everything w without copious amounts of time. And even then, I'm not going to have yeah. the experience that like a Linux kernel developer is going to bring to the table. So no. I don't know if anyone else read this or has any uh, I, more knowledge. I wasted three and a half hours on, on the set of articles you, you just read. Are you serious? <laughs> are you serious or are you messing with me? No, I 100% did. And it was a lot and I still am trying to sort out how I feel about it. <laughs> I feel better. Thanks for that. Did you glean no, any, it was, anything better? It was really than, good though. Like they went really through good. and showed you a lot of the, the thought process of how to like think outside the box, shift kind of where, where they were looking and the, the caveats to why the exploit wasn't working, what some of the catches and, you know, just, just the problems they were having with an OS. Like, Hey, this worked in my VM uh, on, on the cloud. This doesn't work in this environment that we're doing the bug hunting in. Why, why is there a discrepancy? And sometimes there's no way to know. Like they had issues hanging the the VM, hanging the test environment, restarting mm -hmm. that. They had to wait on other people. So it was cool to see some of the the things that you run into as you're doing a pen test. Like it looks all sexy on a report when yeah. you do a pen test. Oftentimes you are banging your head for days trying to get yeah. one thing to work, and then you forgot why you were even trying to get that one thing to work. <laughs> yeah, and and that's the that's the thing about like I said, like but look what you just learned, right? Take take what you just dis, like just described the different system calls and you went down the rabbit hole. Look at what you just learned right there. Even just skimming it, I learned something, right? Even just yeah. like in like not as much time as I felt like I should have spent on it. I still learned something from reading. You learned something, yeah. From reading the article, and I also like bookmark that like 
this is an area that I want to focus on. We were talking about in the previous, right? This I yeah. want to learn some more of these Linux internals. Now it also is kind of it's kind of interesting when I think about the software we run and how much we trust it, and then like what we can do about it if we need to change it, and like kernels and kernel modules and drivers and stuff. Like I feel like that's an interesting <laughs> space because I I've been trying to conceptualize these thoughts. I feel like when I was writing the Python app full time. And I had uh -huh. a library and the library was either outdated or it didn't work anymore or it was vulnerable or whatever it was. I was like, right. you know what? When it came to WordPress, I was like, I'm just going to take the time and I'm going to like, I'm going to rewrite the library myself. And I did that. And that was, mm -hmm. holy crap, was that painful? But like, it wasn't, it's dealing with a REST API. So like, it, it wasn't, it's not rocket science, right? Like I figured it out yeah. and I'm not a great software engineer, but like I figured it out. There were other libraries where I'm like, I'll just switch to a different version and then it's going to break a bunch of my other code, but I'm going to go fix my other code. And like, sometimes I could do that in an hour. I'm like, well, that wasn't bad. But like, let's go down the stack a little bit and go to like <laughs> a Linux kernel module. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if that breaks or I question it or like how, like I wouldn't know all the right questions to ask as to whether it's vulnerable, whether the supply chain has been tampered with throughout it. Right. How, how would I know it? Like that code is like, it's written in C, yeah. and it's really hard to understand. And oh, yeah. with a driver, it's very mm -hmm. similar to like an API is very specific to the API. With a driver, mm -hmm. it's very specific to the hardware. That's the function of a yep. driver is to have you be able to interface with the hardware. And so like I got to go learn the hardware. Then I got to mm -hmm. go read and understand the source code. But then I also have to understand the environment that it's in, which is the kernel, which is a whole mm -hmm. other set of learning. So if I'm... If I think a Linux kernel driver is tampered with, I, I'm not just going off and writing my own kernel driver. Maybe I am, but like that could take me a really long time to it, do. Right? I, it's true. It does take a little a little time, but and I remember reading this article, and this article is super old. Like I'm talking about the year 2000, like June of 2000, from this um, person called Elfkrin, right? And he said. He said, it looks like, and this is when he's saying, you know, the open letter to the wannabe hacker, when he just says, it may seem like a lot of things to learn right now, but you have time yeah. and you need time to make your own experience. Mm -hmm. Believe me, we all learn this way and there is, and there is no better way. So, well, and I think you and, need and to mention it me. from, oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, you're perfect. Mm -hmm. Extra motivation. Paul, I think you're overlooking something really key about Kyle Bott's um, write-up here was he got the first full bounty of $91,337 in KCTF's history. Yeah, that was like a Google program. Mandy, wow. I'm glad you pointed that out because I wanted to it's make sure we mentioned it. It's a based CTF platform. Yeah. Wow. So you got a, you got a, a significant, significant bounty. I would say would call that a significant bounty. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also to... You know, similar to some of the points that both Manny and Charles were making, right? Like, you gotta put your time where you think it's most valuable. So, like right. in some areas, I'm like, I like I'm just gonna use the stuff that makes that stuff work. In other right. areas, I'm like, oh, like I'm gonna like really be bleeding edge. I'm gonna break stuff. I'm gonna fix it myself, and that's where I'm gonna put my put my time commitment, right? And I feel like mm -hmm. my, for example, choice of Linux distro is very much of like where do i want to put my time right like right. i don't want to compile everything all myself and be gen 2 right now on all my where I, <laughs> right. but i don't want to be like handheld like all the distros on the other side of it like i want somewhere right. in between and like where's my in between and that's where i want to spend some time and then even within that realm i want to like pick and choose what i want to like like do i want to learn how to package google chrome for my operating system nah not really mm -hmm. but i want to learn yeah. more about kernel drivers and even delve into eppf because that's interesting to me so maybe uh -huh. i don't pay as much attention and some other stuff just kind of works for me but then there's areas where like i really want to dig in and i think with this as right. much technology that we have today software hardware firmware device and all of the stuff we have available you gotta you gotta kind of pick and choose where you want to dig do. in right you do um but just like this this first this thing over here Recompile the kernel. You know how many times I've broken this machine? Just trying something different. Poor and then machine. I have to maybe like, I've reinstalled the operating system several times. Yeah. Reinstalled FreeBSD several times. But here's the thing. 
had and and that's why I love ZFS. As soon as I reinstalled it on the boot drive, all I had to do was just import all of my file systems back in with um, ZPool import. And that copy, and so I was listening. I was listening about file systems. Someone was mm -hmm. talking about ButterFS versus ZFS, Ooh. and they're like EXE4 is like completely antiquated and lacking so many features. And I'm like, mm -hmm. this is an area where I'm like, I'm not feeling digging into file systems right now. <laughs> like EXT4 works for me. I'm it good. Just works, there yeah. might be a time where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to play with a whole bunch of different file systems and learn them in and out. I'm like, right now, yeah. unless maybe Troj will make a compelling argument that I should start learning ZFS because it's going to make my life so much better. And It's not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely isn't. It's, it's really um, beautiful, but it's not going to make your life better in the short term. Yeah. Okay. And really, and and honestly, like you're perfectly fine with, like just like like LVM is a great, it, it's great. Like it's 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 just like ZFS. I call it two sandwiches. One's a sub, and the other one's a sandwich. Mm -hmm. They both have the same functionality. It's just that they do things different ways. That's all. You know, it's it's no different. Mm. You know, well, we could, both we, could, swappable. we could really go down that rabbit hole of file systems and yeah. <laughs> Linux. But yeah, and kernel drivers and it, it's <sighs> just it's just so much. Like you said, you 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 spend your time and pick. I call it what we all call it, like picking your poison. Mm -hmm. Pick the poison that you want to like sip on and continue to sip until oh. you just get tired of it and you do something different. Along those lines, my story number two. Stranger mm -hmm. Strings, an exploitable flaw in SQLite. This was a similar journey for me because Ooh. the Trail of Bits was talking about another CVE, 2022, 35737, mm -hmm. in case you're interested. Um, and then they start describing like how they got there. It was like a they were, I think, fuzzing PHP and PHP crashed, but PHP crashed because of a SQLite library and the bug was really in SQLite. And then they talked about another blog post that they did. So like in the background, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, we presented this other PHP vulnerability. And then you got to go read that one. And that one's like, well, to understand this one, you got to go read that post. So it's like a whole <laughs> oh, other, yeah. a whole other uh, rabbit hole uh, <laughs> that should go down. But similar things like I'm staring at the C code and I'm like, it's going to be a lot for me to remember how to understand what they're talking about in this vulnerability. It, it is uh, Maybe it's because I only know C, but I don't see why C is that hard to read. Uh, it it's it's not Jeff, but when you when I where I struggle is I have to read it and not just like understand what it does, but understand where the vulnerability is. Even though they're describing it to me in the blog post, like mm -hmm. I've got to understand one the true functionality of it, mm -hmm. and then two where the vulnerability is, and then three how it's being exploited. And then, mm -hmm. like, the, it's like a multi dimensional kind of thing. So, uh, but this was like the, I think it was checking a string and then the string checking functions returning a signed integer versus an unsigned integer. And that was right. involved mm -hmm. uh, in, in the vulnerability. But, like, again, it's in. You ended up with a negative, int a negative, negative value. Int yeah, <laughs> negative value. Right. Yeah. Exactly. As long as it doesn't involve indirect pointers, I'm okay. I don't believe so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Are there pointers again, in, in, in Rust, Charles? Yeah, there's pointers in Rust. There uh, references. Uh, okay. And they're indirect, yeah. too. That's why it doesn't yeah. have string overflows. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Look, Rust, Rust is a... Um, and, and they have struts as well. So, I mean... Again, if you learn C, Rust, um, the transition is not that bad. See, but I'm really... No. Oh, this is bad. I'm really rusty with my C coding. <laughs> That's Good the Lord, problem. Because no. <laughs> I spent like too much time. To I'm going to hit you so damn hard. Would you please make oil cans so we can <laughs> smack him with that? <laughs> That's what I was saying, bro. We look like we need some oil cans. Because <laughs> I went to Python <clears throat> and I fell in love with the data structures in Python. And I'm like, and I'm like this is great. But again, I think the sequel, the sequel one is uh, very very important to the things we've been talking about, right? Because it's a library with inside of there. And right. so you start to think about the infrastructure that's running that you can get to get a negative value integer to exploit with inside of a library for a database that runs on this infrastructure. They say that there's, SQLite is There's used, a pretty good attack chain there for some bad stuff. 
And Tyler, to your point, Esculate, according from the article, Esculate is used in nearly everything from naval warships to smartphones to other programming languages. Oh, yeah, it's definitely smartphones. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I imagine we'll see some interesting things come out of this one. It's not as straightforward. Like you, you can get the exploit to pop, but you're talking about a library with inside of something in order to do that. So the exploit chain for this one in order to do something like an Android breakout for one of the SQLite databases that you know, you're going to leverage for this. That's going to be a much more difficult venture to kind of leverage this. Yeah, that being gotta, said, this is a really bad exploit. Like you got to trigger, some, some you got to trigger the vulnerable code and your path to triggering that vulnerable code is going to depend on the application. Yep. Hmm. And then what's amazing for all the time you put in, somebody writes a patch for it and it's back to square one again. That's <laughs> if people actually apply the patch though. That's true too. But when they do, it hurts. Yeah, back to the drawing board. <laughs> um, not all those places you've got that embedded SQLite are going to be patchable. This is true. Hey, Lee, welcome, too. Lee. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, there's so many people on remotely that we don't have everyone on a monitor, so make sure you, you, you jump right in just like Lee did. It's good to have not you. Not a problem. Lee, how are you doing? Hey, everybody. Hey. Um, I wanted to also talk about Microsoft's uh, driver block list. And so this has been a, a really hotly debated topic. And there's an article from Malwarebytes that's kind of like Microsoft fixes driver block list, placing users at risk from BYOVD, bring your own vulnerable driver attacks. Um, I want to say, first of all, I kind of, I don't like the acronym because it's not always a vulnerable driver that's the problem. Sometimes the problem is someone lost a signing certificate or someone stole a signing certificate. Sometimes the problem yeah. is it's not it's not really a vulnerable driver, but the driver has functionality that malicious actors are using for evil on your system. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of reasons why I would want to block a driver, I guess I should say. And like Microsoft's response, <clears throat> so like Microsoft didn't really fix, hadn't really fixed this problem maybe up until this point. But Jeffrey Sutherland, who is Jeffrey Sutherland? He works. The person you're about to quote. He <laughs> works for Microsoft. Yeah. I'm not sure his position at uh, Microsoft. Um, but he says we've updated the online docs and added a download with instructions to apply the binary version directly. I'm assuming he's talking about the block list. And then he says we're also fixing the issues with our servicing process which has prevented devices from receiving updates to the policy. I think that was part of the problem is they had a driver block policy, but it wasn't being applied to a select number of workstations for some reason. And then Malwarebytes Lab says that this has been done. The gap in synchronization across OS versions has been closed because there was also an issue where Microsoft said, yeah, like we'll give you a, an updated driver block list but it's only on the latest version of Windows 10 and Windows 11 that you'll get that. So I'm not sure what synchronization across OS version means. Like how far back are you going to apply this block list? And this all again sounds like a bunch of promises from Microsoft that like they really still haven't fixed the problem. They've just kind of acknowledged it like, oh, we'll make it a little better for you. Tyler, so how, yeah, I, I think this is a problem in a lot of ways. Like this isn't just a problem with Microsoft not doing a good job of adding a block list. Like this is inherent to the functioning of Windows itself, right? Like drivers are always just have always been an issue. That's where you insert rootkits, and that's how you get rootkits on there. Uh, so vulnerable drivers really is a an OEM and manufacturer and developer issue. So fixing the drivers themselves, like we're always going to have vulnerable drivers and that's not on Microsoft. Having a block list and the capability to do a block list, I think that's a step and an easy thing that Microsoft's allowed, but them maintaining that block list, that's kind of different. I think this is where we need to change that design and have something similar to uh, like secure boot and bootloaders where yeah. it takes a little bit more effort. You sign the, the drivers and then you have the ability to do an integrity check and have only the drivers that you need on your system to function, not but have everything available. But they should, re if there's a vulnerable driver, right? And I make Paul's Windows driver 
there's a vo- and I get it signed by Microsoft. There's a vulnerability in it. I fixed that vulnerability. I've changed the code. I have to go back to Microsoft, right? Do I have to go back to Microsoft? There's, to not, get my a, driver? there's not a revocation that you just are using your driver signing cert as an OEM or a developer. At so am, that I re- point. Like am, am I re gotten- am I re signing an updated driver with my own code, or do I have to go back to Microsoft to get a new a new key signed or whatever? Like, do I have to redo that whole process and resubmit it to Microsoft? Mm. Reality or sure? Um, it depends on the behavior. It depends no. on if it's the no, WHQL yes. drivers, like if it's the ones right. Microsoft includes as part of the OS versus ones that you're installing from the OEM or well, the see, vendor. Now you're, right? now you're like talking their, like, their driver will be signed by them. Now you're talking like my coworkers, like it depends. And then the waters <laughs> get muddy. It really does. <laughs> it really but does. If this is a malware, you could sign it and Windows would run it. You well, do not that, need to go to Microsoft. Say that again, Sam. For purposes of the attack, you could sign it without going to Microsoft, and it would still be accepted by the OS. I got it. so I could fix a vulnerability and re re-sign it, and it yes. Would, but then the old one that's vulnerable is signed with the same certificate, so I can't revoke that certificate because both the vulnerable and not vulnerable versions of my driver are signed. I think that's right. I got gotcha. you. What I'm saying that's is why you need. What I'm saying is why Microsoft to, should issue yeah. an issue a new key. For the not vulnerable oh. version, so that's got a different signing uh, certificate, right? And then I well, can go would... revoke the old one that is that is vulnerable. Yeah, but Microsoft is not involved. It would be you getting another signing certificate if you wanted to do that. So I just go to Microsoft and I'm like, I got this driver, and they're like, yeah, it's cool. Like you can sign it, and it's all on you now. And now I I control everything with that driver moving forward. And I can change it. Or more importantly, somebody that smacks your system with some malware controls everything moving forward. So Microsoft's not really signing the driver. They're signing the the company and saying, you can release they drivers sh- and you're cool. They're delegating they- They're delegating the trust. <laughs> right. It's the, yes. it's the yes. web of yes. trust on all yeah. of them. Oh, let's not bring up trust. No, well, no, that, depends on, that depends on <laughs> if it's a high integrity uh, driver and if it's being put into ring zero into a kernel, whether it's a kernel driver. And that is signed and verified by Microsoft to load as a kernel driver versus there are other Device layers driving. or rings so, that Microsoft uh, allows for driver signing uh, from a company, which is technically uh, one of the kind of code signing certs. It's so similar my, to my, that. Tyler, Microsoft makes the distinction between a ring one and a ring two, ring two being the higher, le- ring one being more of the lower level, right? Um. I believe I believe they do for some of the kernel level ones. At least at least the ones that Microsoft pushes in as a WHQL driver that is from Microsoft and verified and can be pushed with something like Windows Update. Mm-hmm. Now the process for just having a regular driver signing cert, I believe, is the same process you go through or to like get code, a sir, code yeah. signing cert, uh, and is just validated by Microsoft and and has a uh, the driver signature enforcement DSE, mm-hmm. uh, which is looking to see if that driver has been signed and if the enforcement matches the root of trust that you're claiming to be leveraging for the code for that. So here's a question, right? And I wonder how much of this is going to change when, because remember a while back, Microsoft was talking about adopting Rust as part of its kernel, right? I wonder how much is that process going to change as far as like like signing driver signing and everything else once they incorporate rust into the the new windows kernel well like it it shouldn't matter what the driver's written in right i mean you're signing the in some cases you're signing the actual code in other cases it sounds like more of a secure boot model where you're validating the company like basically mm-hmm. that's a questionnaire like are you going to protect your private key yes i'm going to protect my private key. okay you're cool <laughs> <laughs> I I really hope it's that simple for him. <laughs> that would it's, be I mean, cool. It, I don't want to. I don't wanna throw Microsoft under the bus. There, it is. It is more complicated. They do. They do review, from what I can tell, and I haven't had uh-huh. any official statements from Microsoft on this, right? But according, like, to their documentation that I could find, they do some level of that. Like for secure boot, they do say, like, hey, if you've got a bootloader and you want us to sign it to be in the secure boot process like you you got there has to be certain aspects of your code that implement these protections and is coded securely before we'll even think about you know entering you into the chain of trust for secure boot so the the real big issue is like whether or not microsoft is is blocking drivers that have are are 
are known to be using or be used by attackers as exploitation. The driver itself may actually not be buggy, may not even have anything wrong with it. It may just be vulnerable because of, you know, it, it's side loading or side channeling uh, different DLLs uh, or has a permission wrong on one of the files it sets. And so you've got all of these vulnerabilities that could exist in multiple drivers outside of the ones that they're blocking, but they're playing the whack-a-mole right. game of intelligence and the threat intelligence they have for active uh, adversaries, you know, things like TrickBot or one of the APT groups leveraging any of these that are being pushed through the updates, those are the ones that they're focusing on and and calling out and being able to block. So I, I see this being changed in the future with how Microsoft handles drivers and driver loads. They're, they've been trying to out uh, to fix this for, for quite a while and have a core competency set of, you know, core drivers and then have other things load with inside of sandboxes and user space. But until that happens, this is, you know, the attack surface reduction rules, your AMC, your Defender, all of those things are the, the layered defense that they're relying on in order to not have some of this uh, cause issues. But you're at ring zero with the driver, so this is uh, an attacker's wet dream most days. Yeah, it's a cat and mouse game. Like, EDR is trying to go... We'll detect your, <laughs> your malicious drivers, and malicious drivers are like, yeah, but if I get there first, I'm just going to unload your EDR because I'm in ring zero. Or, or I go find a, a, a leaked driver or I compromise a company that has a signing cert, and right. I you know use that for my my signing. Uh, there's a hundred ways that the adversaries are, are doing this uh, and you know not getting caught. So again, whack-a-mole and having that defense in depth uh, and not letting them get to that ring zero because that becomes a very difficult game after that, as you know. I have a question on anyone's experience with how often is 32-bit version of Windows used versus 64-bit? Um, Almost never and, now. Like unless you're talking about embedded systems uh, or a very specific use case. Call that, you know, three years ago, that might have been a 20% market. I'm, there's numbers out there and there's a bunch of figures, but uh, it would be very rare to see a 32-bit Windows system being leveraged. Actually, your point, Tyler, like, like, like Mandy, Mandy, hang on one like second. Tyler, your point about embedded systems embedded, was a really like good one. ICS, that's about the only place I see them. In ICS, okay. Because I was looking at yeah. Microsoft.com, and um, it, it says that driver signing is not required on 32-bit versions of Windows. So it seems then that would be a much easier yeah, way. Microsoft does not recommend or, I mean, they still support, but they do not push 32-bit anymore, and that's that's one of the reasons they've they've been pushing forward. Like 32-bit's mm -hmm. been going out for quite a while, and every all your modern processes are all 64-bit. So it'd be very, again, it would be a legacy system. ICS would be very uh, specific. A VM, perhaps. <laughs> a process, a right? Because like you can spin up system. 30. You can well, you can because you can emulate a 32-bit uh -huh. system like in VMware, right? Like that's a that's a thing. Yeah. And even I mean, and they're lucky it's not the year twenty thirty eight where all the thirty <laughs> <laughs> we're having a party in twenty thirty eight. Go back to nineteen seventy. <laughs> <laughs> we have Anything the Y two K bug all over again, right? That's yep. a thing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I used January first, nineteen seventy. Maintain a package. We deployed Jesus. site wide, and this and the package I had to do sixty four and thirty two bit versions. I haven't had to do a thirty two bit version for like five years now. Yeah, Lee's audio is mm -hmm. coming in really quiet. For me. Yeah, Lee's very, oh, well, very I can quiet. make it hotter. Or maybe make it hotter, Lee. <laughs> How's that? Is yeah, that talking your talking your <laughs> sultry voice. That is so steaming. Like, I you can't want the round voice. Charles okay. Said. What was that, Mandy? I can't hear Charles hardly at all. Interesting. All right. Hopefully Goose heard that. Testing, testing. Better. A lot better? better? It's a little better, yeah. Still. Well, you know, we talk a lot about retro tech, so now we're just, we're 2007 podcasting right now, which is awesome. Yeah! <laughs> we're, both, we're going back into the fold a little bit. That's it. Um, <laughs> let's see, where do I want to go? Oops, I've cranked the Scarlet all the way. That sounds a little better, a little, little blown out, but... Yeah, well, yeah, it's giving me some red lights. I'm going to have to back it down, because it's, it's, yeah, it's not happy. <laughs> Hopefully Goose can, Goose can give you a boost on our end. Uh, so this was the article that I that I pulled when I was talking about the focus on Windows, right? Like there was an um, the article title is "Fantastic Rootkits" since we're on the topic of rootkits, uh, and uh -huh. where to find them? Part one. This one came from CyberArk, and look, I'm not bashing CyberArk here. 
They did an amazing job with this article. Their research team is amazing. I, I interviewed their, some of their researchers several years ago. They do awesome work. But one of the things that gets me is this Windows-centric view of the world. Like, title says fantastic root kits, but it really should say fantastic Windows root kits. There's all their OSs out there that have root kits, right? Linux, Mac OS, embedded OSs, um, even inside of firmware that we call boot kits, right? They run on different hardware, different architectures, but most articles are focused, like we were saying before, like on Windows x86. And I, I see this, you know, I see this changing. I think... I think ARM is making a huge push onto the desktop. And oh, so yeah. The, the rootkits are going to have to change, right? Like, I know it's funny. I remember, I wanted to bring this up in the, the previous segment too. Like, I had this NAS device from Netgear and it was running embedded Linux. It had heinous vulnerabilities, heinous, like old school <laughs> Linux vulnerabilities. And then uh -huh. I dug in and I'm like, but it's running a Spark processor. Like, <laughs> And like, dumb, dumb. I had to really search <laughs> to find um, uh, a shell code that would actually run and spark on Linux, right? You you know what I miss? The netbooks. Remember the netbooks? Yeah, netbooks. <laughs> oh, hell. With the Atom processor? Yes. Oh, yeah. my goodness. And there was some power. It was so convenient. I, so one of my coworkers, like, he has the world's greatest collection of retro computing stuff. Like, uh -huh. literally, you can ask him for something, and 75% <laughs> of the time, it's in arm's reach. I'm you like, dude, it. you got, like, a Quark yeah. processor, or you got, like, one of the original Itanium process. One time I asked oh, him, yeah. do you have the original Itanium processor? He's like, oh, oh, yeah, it's, like, right here. I'm like, how is that in arm's reach? <laughs> I don't understand, dude. I'm like, Ed, you're, you're amazing. <laughs> it's awesome. I'm like, you got, like... A power PC based laptop is oh yeah, I got this one that was oh, yeah, made right, by right, like, right. like Lenovo. It was a ThinkPad. <laughs> it was made in blah 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 blah. I'm like, how is that arm's reach? I don't understand. It's, dude, you're it, it's amazing. <laughs> you gotta love I'm it. Ask him if he's Look, got some PA wrist CPUs <laughs> lying around. I'm sure that'll next uh hopefully Thursday is when we do our regular group meeting where, where Ed's on and I'll ask him on Thursday. So let's be clear. Hey. This is not the world's best collection of antique hardware. He's just a hoarder. Mm. He is. Yeah. Like all, he's, he's admitted, like all that stuff that we've gotten rid of over the years. Yeah. Ed's like gone and picked it up and it's in his garage. But it does <laughs> but it does beg oh, the wow. question the, the, the organizations out there that are using the older technology, you, you stumbled upon something that's running on Spark and you're st you're more or less stumped. Uh you know, uh, what's a bad guy gonna do? Most of I I am of the opinion that most of the bad guys aren't necessarily savvy enough to go deep into and bother with looking up that stuff they're yeah, just going to move like, on and look for something be like, else wait, that's vulnerable yeah i can cross so yeah something... i can cross compile this shell code that i have which is mm -hmm. makes me want to gouge my eyes out with a fork whenever i say cross compile or i can go find the next target right like mm -hmm. unless mm -hmm. they're really determined and that's one of the only attack paths they have in that target they're likely going to yeah. move on. They're either they may not move on from the but, target, but, Jeff, but they're going to find another way they get into that target, right? Well, yeah. And that's my point. I mean, uh, you know, a security re researcher, a pen tester mm -hmm. that's been hired to do it, maybe they'll do it. But the bad guys, they're just going to move on to the next target, aren't they? Yeah, perhaps. I mean, oh, yeah. it, it, I mean, when you're dealing with nation states, they can they have a tendency to be don't throw nations. Okay, but like Stuxnet, you're writing <coughs> very specific. Right. malware that tampers with very specific mm -hmm. devices and that's not that doesn't happen every day sure it maybe happens right. more often than it did 20 years ago right maybe maybe not i'm you know i don't know mm -hmm. but the point is a but, motivated enough attacker but most is, of the but most of less the bad frequently guys, occurring. most of the bad guys out there are just looking for a target of opportunity still to this day nation quick states score. yeah i, I mean mm. Targeted attacks against you specifically, and they're really going to try to dig into <laughs> what do you have? How can I break it? How can I get past this? Yes, they'll do it. But the majority of the bad guys that are out there that are just trying to make a buck, I mm -hmm. mean, they're trying to make mm -hmm. a living too. Right. I think they're just going to move on. So, I mean, it, it, yeah. I mean, I throw up a little in my mouth when I say it, but there's something to be said for, you know, you still use that old technology and nobody knows how it works and nobody wants to bother and, and they move on. I'm kind of I'm a, not advocating I'm, it. Along those lines, though, I'm I'm a, enamored with 
the M1, M2 and ARM processors within Apple. When I look at them mm -hmm. from a firmware level, there's not as much public documentation about how they're implementing that security at what you know we tend to coin like below the surface, right? Mm -hmm. But not yet. Th not yet. Because then I look at like <laughs> all the crap they fixed this week. <laughs> like, oh, you really don't really need to go to that level if you want to pop macOS. Because I mean, it begs a lot the, of other it begs the stuff. question. We're talking about security through obscurity, or at least a variation <clears> of it. And you know, where I came from, that wasn't valid. But I think there is some level of validity to it in the commercial world, in a in a commercial context. But it's time, like like Charles said, like not yet. Like, it's yeah. just it's just time. Like it, <laughs> it. Does that mean it's more secure because we don't have the information we need to exploit it? Like eventually, that Definitely stuff not. comes out. But what I will say though, but is it goes to impact and and a, and a variation of impact. I mean, the way we used to evaluate risk back where I used to work was the mm -hmm. likelihood. Not only the likelihood of success, that was one measurement, but also the likelihood that somebody's actually going to attempt to try to break this or try to attack. But it's also based on information they can gather. And in Apple's case, they control the supply chain very, very tightly. Mm -hmm. Contrast that to mm -hmm. Intel. Like the leak we saw a couple of weeks ago with Intel source code and uh, boot guard and all that stuff, that wasn't mm -hmm. an Intel leak, but it was an OEM partner because Intel's not making the chip and the computer and the operating mm -hmm. system like apple is apple controls that supply chain wholeheartedly yeah. right or, or more so than intel does where they're just making the processor they're going to go to dell they go to hp they go to Lenovo, Motorola. and a million other yeah. you know uh, suppliers they got to be like i got to give you stuff so that you can put together a pc or server or a laptop now you've just widened that supply chain and eventually someone has a leak and we're like, oh, that's how microcode updates work on your Intel CPU. And we know that because like Intel had to tell a whole bunch of people how that works so that they could get Intel CPUs and put it in your Lenovo or your Chromebook or whatever, whatever it is. Right. So in that sense, it is security through obscurity. But like, I hate to say it's pretty good security through obscurity. Right? Well, that's just like this is like some place that still have mainframes. Yeah. So right? it's very true. There's a few places. What's the likelihood there in this day and age of 2022, if you have a mainframe, what's the likelihood it, is it going to get attacked? Or what's the likelihood that somebody's going to be that determined to, to take your company down by figuring out how to gain access and do bad things to the mainframe? And, and that, these are the questions I'm asking, Charles, because mm -hmm. like <clears throat> I've studied how like UEFI works on Intel mm -hmm. x86 PC architecture. It is really well documented. Again, because Intel spreads it out, lets a lot of people make Intel based PCs, right? They have to put data sheets out there, they have to share code. And it's mm -hmm. UEFI is open, there's Tiano Core and EDK2, right? Like there's right. open source implementation. We can all go, if you're so inclined, you can go read the code, you can go read the open UEFI spec. Like it's all out there. And right. then I'm I like to your mainframe thing, I'm like, how's that work on a on a mainframe? How's it work on an ARM? Pro How does it work on all this more, not right. esoteric, but more esoteric stuff? I'm like, they've got to have similar concepts. And I start asking my coworkers mm -hmm. these questions. And they're like, well, like, we're, like our propellers start spinning really fast, right? <laughs> I'm like, yep. like, how does this work? Like, now that I understand how it works on Intel, which is very well documented, and mm -hmm. I'm graced with I work with people that used to work with Intel, so I can ask them like really nerdy questions and they like know the answer off the top of their head. I'm like, you're amazing. And I'm like, oh, so that's how it works in Intel. But I'm like, when you get to a mm -hmm. mainframe that's a totally different process or totally different architecture, like you still something needs to happen when you push the power button that initializes the hardware that mm -hmm. loads some basic drivers, that loads the uh, firmware. That loads right. code that allows you to interface with all the other hardware that eventually loads a bootloader that eventually loads a kernel. Like there's some similar kind of process that happens. I'm like, how do they, how do they secure that? Like, are there, is there a secure boot? Like, and how different is that? Is there, is there SMM? Like how did, like there has to be similarities, but there again, your point, like it's, it's security in, in obscurity. And we tend to focus on much like yeah. the Intel. We focus on Microsoft, right. and we focus security on security by obsolescence or something. I don't know. It's a different. It's a different term, but 
it, I, I hate to say it, but I think it's legitimate for many organizations because, again, I don't think most bad guys are going to take the, yeah, the but time I, I don't, and the effort to go after it. But I don't think you can right. bank on that, right? And the example that I bring it up in this case. It depends on who you are. Yeah, I mean, that's goes, a risk-based decision. It but depends it goes, on where you are. I mean, sorry, I can throw in here. But with greater companies, like more and more people, especially smaller companies, outsourcing more I think there's a real possibility that in other countries, this older technology, hardware, software, and stuff is what's still more prevalent. Yeah, and there's also like that. I can see that. Yeah, but there's a hacker tenacity too. Like, and I, I've brought up Stuxnet in this capacity, and not so much the malware itself or the nation mm -hmm. states involved, but there was, I forget their names, and I apologize, but they were reverse engineering Stuxnet and they basically got to the code that was like the very specific programming PLC code language that was on those uh -huh. PLCs. And I forget, I even forget now what it's called. I used to, I've said it on a previous show and they were like, we don't understand this code. Like uh, there's only like a handful of people in the world that have ever coded in this language and we want to understand what it's doing. And they mm -hmm. like couldn't get any help with it. So they went and found the hardware. They found the books. Like they found a reference manual. Like this is old school hacking. We we're talking about Charles in the previous segment, right? Mm -hmm. They found the friggin' manual somewhere and they were like, <laughs> I'm going to learn this language. And they learned the language. And then they were like, oh, they're messing with the PLCs to mess with the centrifuges in very specific ways, mm -hmm. right? And the only way they got to that answer was they had to understand this really esoteric, back to your point, Jeff, like really esoteric stuff. Right. And sometimes attackers are going to do that. Like, it depends on what's but, on the line. It depends on the goals. It depends on economics at that point. Well, really, yeah, right? yeah. It depends right, so on it depends on issues other than strictly the the vulnerabilities and the and the, yeah. and the uh, above me on the technology. Right. The technology. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. And and somehow that has to be factored in. I mean, that that's yeah. that's something we don't talk about enough. Mm -hmm. In, in in our in our world is you know we go on and on about the vulnerabilities and oh my gosh it's you right. know there's this thing it could be yes it could be exploited very is that, easily is that probability or likelihood it's, it's one the, of those it's two. the likelihood of success <laughs> likely. versus the yeah. likelihood of somebody's actually going to go through what it takes to actually and the probability is whether or not they're going to be successful with the previous i always get get probability so, and likelihood because you can kind of interchange. Them, I don't right? think. Uh, I, well, no, I don't think probability and likelihood are the same thing. Because I mean, in many What's the cases, difference? well, in many cases, the probability that something is going to work, based on what we know about it, is pretty right. damn high. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. yes, it'll work. It'll work. If somebody actually tried this, if if certain conditions existed and the planets align and yeah, they have this level of like, probability is, sci is science. Basically, probability right? is yeah. basically yeah. fifty fifty. It works or it doesn't. That that to me like is probably like if an exploit requires. I think I got a D. If the exploit requires like warp college. drive, right. like the probability that with technology we have today you're going to be able to do warp drive like we have in Star Trek, pretty low. Right, <laughs> right. But if it's pretty, if it's pretty high, then you switch to likelihood and go. All right. Well, I mean, like, it's why would like someone do it, that? It, it's like the 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 vulnerabilities that you know have been you know pushed out in terms of the cryptography and the encryption that's out there, like you know the deprecation of. SSL a couple years ago. Yeah, it's early versions on the technology. of TLS. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we were tenable, that was a big, huge deal because a certain council said no more, no more SSL right. was going to be allowed, and our product was using SSL still, one of mm -hmm. our products. Um, but the, you know, and and, and Renault, uh, in his defense, you know, he's like, yeah, but you know, there has to be so many conditions that are met, and a, and everything has to be such before you ever get a chance to exploit And that's probability it. that it's actually going to work. Well, it's... That an exploit is actually No, gonna it's work. probability that somebody's going to take the time and the effort time and the expense yeah. to try to do it. Right. If they could mm -hmm. get it to work, yes, they could work. But what's what's the return on it? Yeah. You know, in, you know hey, mm -hmm. how long have we been into the show and I haven't mentioned PCI? If you have to go way through... Way too long. Way too long. <laughs> if you have to go through... <laughs> You know, days and hours. Everybody and weeks. take a drink. Uh, we haven't we haven't done that. We've in a been long taking time. a lot of drinks. <laughs> um, but and have you know, a double. If you mm -hmm. have to expend a whole lot of effort, and the result is you get maybe one credit card 
is it really worth the mm -hmm. effort? Because right. there's a thousand other companies out there that are j doing so many other things wrong that you can just harvest a thousand credit cards for a whole lot less effort. I mean, I, you know, philosophically, I don't agree with it, but it, it's, you know, pragmatically, I'm going to go get the thousand cards for a whole lot less effort than mount a cryptographic right. attack and do all these things mm -hmm. to get the one card from this one particular customer that has this glaring vulnerability <laughs> because they're using SSL instead of TLS. So that's like, like, um, right now, right? Say, say if there was a, a, a new startup, right? And I'm, I'm the bad guy and it's a new startup. The first thing I'm going to do, of course, um, like OSINT and see what, um, I'm always going to look at like the age range, look at the age range of, the folks that are working at the company if there's if it's a startup company and, and there's like say the 20 some say it's like from age 20 to 25 right and say i find out that they have all these defense mechanisms in place and edr the, the all the bells and whistles right and say if i was motivated enough to write exploits well yeah bypasses are exploits in a language they probably don't even think about. Let's say COBOL, for example. Yeah. God. And compile in okay. COBOL <laughs> into an, an executable where it's talking to the Windows API and I can do all kinds of different um, dangerous stuff. Can you put COBOL to Rust? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I know you could do it with WebAssembly. So I could run Rust in the browser with WebAssembly. Yeah, but even easier, I'm just going to go pull like a 2005 version of interpreter if that's a thing when did refer i looked at once to see when interpreter was first released on, uh -huh. on like github in, in metasploit it's like <laughs> go pull some of the early versions of interpreter right like get those working and then deploy that and your eater goes oh that's totally fine because <laughs> it's so you'd be old, surprised right yeah. you'd be surprised what you can get by yeah taking the older stuff and i i, I love that as as a hack right because the yeah i think as you iterate as as a defensive mechanism like an EDR, you start going, oh, there's like a new technique. Oh, there's a new technique. Like I got to tune my defensive code to go new mm -hmm. technique, new technique, new technique. And like some point, there's got to be some kind of scientific study we could do. Like at some point, you increase your likelihood that older signatures and code will be successful because yeah. the defensive mechanisms are looking for all the newer stuff and they've lost that signature and behavior detection for older stuff right or even even hiding like putting like imagine putting a raspberry that a game pi boy? around this you have a game yeah that's game boy <laughs> tetris i actually have um super mario land Aw, nice. <laughs> Pokemon, come on. Well, Pokemon wasn't invented World. in 1989. Was that the... <laughs> that's the take, original one. Does that take just like alkaline batteries? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, um, right? There was double a... Double double A's. A's. Four like double before A's. USB yep. charging and all that crap, right? Yep. 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 <laughs> Do you have a Game Gear, just out of curiosity? Yes, I have a Game Gear. Nice. Um, Nintendo Power, Power Glove? Yep, I do have a power glove. There's Mattel a game here. Electronic Football? Yes, I do. Oh. Holy crap. I will beat oh. you. Oh, I guarantee. You beat me I see, now, we're playing, now we're playing the game. Oh, see, but it's not an arm's football. reach. He had to get up. So. <laughs> he did have to get He loses points for having to get up. <laughs> he can't hear us oh, right come now. Come on. Remember the, <laughs> the football take his headphones with the, off, magnet, with the vibrating magnetic players He's going to get it. make all a racket as they moved around? What was that, Lee? The, the the football that was uh, vibrating magnetic uh, tutor. I, I posted that on uh, on our Slack channel. I mean, my first electronic game was electric <laughs> football, where you put all these pieces on a oh, board and you turn it on, and the and the board oh, just yeah. vibrated, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the play stops when the defense touches the player that's got the little felt football. Oh my oh, what god, is, I haven't seen that in yeah. 40 freaking years. What what is that? What is that again? I don't even That is Mattel, that's that's Mattel electronic, electronic football. football. Wow. Yeah, I guarantee out. you Charles I can beat you. I will bet you $1000. <laughs> Yo, you're bringing that to the next conference man and we're live streaming that shit. <laughs> um Charles Along with the power And there's the Along power. There you go. <laughs> Charles what do you do with what do you do with the power glove now though? Do you play Mike Tyson Punch Out on your old 
Yeah. Um, I even have the power pad. The power pad's rolled up in the um closet here with the t-shirts. Um, <laughs> we're not inviting Charles to the death match. I think he'll win. Uh, no. Charles, on the 13th of December, you're getting picked up. You're rolling up here and picking me up, and then we're rolling up to the to the to Rhode Island, okay? Uh oh, with, with, okay. Your power, with your power glove apparently, and your Mattel with the power no, no, glove. No, we're in the Mattel <laughs> electronic football. We're gonna play on air, <laughs> and I will be, I will beat you, guaranteed. Wow. I will beat yes. you. Yes. How many thousands of hours do you have on that thing, man? Oh my God, dude! It <laughs> like I'll wake up some mornings, right, and I'll just like you know what. I want to play this today. Some days I want to play the Neo Geo. Some days I want to play the Sega Dreamcast. Some days I want to play the simple electronic football. Um, I also have um, Double Dragon, too, on the handheld, Tiger handheld. Do you add the uh, green, the, the uh, electronic, me Metallo electronic football, too? Isn't that what we have? It was we have a, a double green. Well, hold on. We have a Double Dragon cabinet sitting right behind me. We do. Can you see that? I know. Oh, yeah. Yes. Classic. The Larry, original Double Larry Dragon. Restored That's that a classic. It, it lives here in the studio. But this is a news segment. Oh, <laughs> we, yeah. Yes. We, we, we talked about too. the news. <laughs> I, but anyway, back to the news. Back to the news. So my story number 26, <laughs> uh, interesting. So an R Evil insider sent an email revealing sensitive information about the group's operations. This comes from the title of the article. is like, this is ransomware hackers' biggest weakness. It's essentially a mole. And I'm like... That's not ransomware's no. biggest weakness. I'm like, that's no. every criminal group in existence' biggest weakness. <laughs> like, didn't you watch The Godfather? Like, Fredo, I knew it was you. Like, moles have yeah. been a thing since the beginning of time. How is that? Like, we're stretching here now with our articles when yeah. we're saying like a mole within a ransomware group is their biggest weakness. Like, we've you got to you got to treat them like said Michael. You're my brother, and I love you. <laughs> But <laughs> yeah, we go against the family. <laughs> Leave you the know gun, it's a bad day if there's plastic laid out on the carpet when you right. walk into the office. That's it. Leave the gun. <laughs> take the cannoli. But so <laughs> also, what's funny is like we can go back to when uh, law U.S. law enforcement was infiltrating mm -hmm. like early on uh, hacker groups. One of them, I forget which story it was. I think it was in the like the Max Vision Max Butler story. Where one uh -huh. of the investigators, his handle in like the underground forum was Master Splinter. Because he mm. was the rat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like no one picked up on that. <laughs> like yeah. his handle was literally Master Splinter. No one's like, yeah. Hey, wait, the that, best way to hide that, things is like right in Ninja out Turtles. He's a rat. Like, hiding in plain be? sight. Hiding in plain sight, man. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. moles are always. And again, mo I'm mixing. Like a mole, like whether it's an insider or whether it's someone infiltrating the group. It's usually like one of those two things, right? Undercover, Look at Anonymous. Mm -hmm. Undercover, Anonymous, uh, was it LawSec? Mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of those groups, right? Yeah. yeah LawSec. Was just... it Law? It was LawSec that was. LawSec. Uh, uh, I can't remember his name now. One of the main figures. I think it was LawSec. I wasn't it's, prepared it's... to talk about this topic tonight in <laughs> hacker group history and the. <laughs> Moles, but again, where are we going? News. It's this rabbit hole. You know, you know I, what? I, we gotta I blame the colonel drivers. Jump to Mandy's story it's all about two. the colonel drivers. Yeah. Okay, let's talk go. about Mandy's story number two. I want to go to my story. Well, I want to say on 26, I think that this should be used when doing awareness training to general population and say, Hey, look, you're not the only one. Even our evil did this to themselves, right? Like they're basically yeah. did their own yeah. fishing campaign. Like, our evil yeah. needs insider threat detection. <laughs> Like, they totally buy that. I think we should tell, like, like you don't need to feel bad. Even our evil does this. <laughs> so, a, a quick tangent. I have a question for everybody. If if you happen, you know, hypothetically, if you work for a company that is engaged with a company that does security awareness by doing simulated phishing attacks, so they send out the periodic email that you're not supposed to click on the link, if you click on the link in your mobile phone and not on your corporate laptop that's logged in to the VPN and you're connected, if it was a bad phishing email, would you still get compromised? It depends. Uh, depends, yeah. It, didn't Touché. you just call out people for saying it depends? 
I did, and then I totally just said it. <laughs> it depends is like the most common phrase used in PCI world by QSAs, by the way. <laughs> I, d so, I tell one of my coworkers, like, he, he should have a t-shirt that says it depends. <laughs> Every time I ask him a question, I'm like, so like in UFEI, yeah, like, if this is like the, the th threat, like, does it work? He's like, well, it depends. I'm like, dude, you always say that. <laughs> And like I love I'm gonna it because then he goes on a full <laughs> explanation of like why it depends. And I'm like, oh, awesome, but like it's always it depends. But back to your question, my question. Yeah. It, Wait, it, I have it a question. So is that similar that if you were a woman, would that be a well actually it instead of an it depends? It depends on what. Well, actually, it depends. It depends on the type of the answer. Oh. It depends on what the evil link is trying to do. I mean, what does it and, depend and, on? And Manny, to be honest, as we and get the older, hardware. Depends is becomes even more important. More important, yeah. But if it's just a, I'm getting older. Depends has a whole new meaning for me right there. But you're you're still gonna be shit out of luck because if the phishing attack comes to your phone and you click on it and it's a like a a a mock page that looks like your login page but it's not your login page and you are still on your phone you enter your credentials. Yeah, but I would still I would do that. Of course, you would never do that. I would not do that. But you would. No, I mean, I maybe not you, but no. someone would. I don't care if it's you or someone else. Like, someone just needs to do it in your organization. And my chances mm -hmm. go up the more people that are in your organization that would enter their credentials into my phishing site. I just need one. That's all yeah. I need. Then I'm good. Then I'm off to the races from there. Right, Tyler? Tyler's still here? I can't see Tyler. It's really... Tyler. And I love looking Tyler. at Tyler, first of all. Say something, Tyler. Maybe he's gone. Uh-oh. Tyler's what not here, Tyler? man. He's oh! not there. Look, look, he's gone. He's, he's gone. gone. Oh, man. I went to get a sandwich. <laughs> like, <laughs> It's dinner time. Now he's, he's not here, time. man. Tyler's out getting a pizza. I mean, you can have pizza delivered. Although, the Lee can oh, just say for Tyler. Oh, yeah, well, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, hey, all right, Lee. Lee. It's an older version of Tyler. <laughs> That's it. That's I all. love it. <laughs> He's probably got Way to use those kernel drivers, now. folks. It's all about the kernel drivers. Um, yeah. Did Mandy, did you have a story you wanted to share with us? So he brought up story number two. And we're going to talk about the USPS and something they have done. The Postal Service has released a forever stamp that is dedicated to women cryptologists of World War II. Oh, Code Girls is one of my favorite books. Maybe love that book. And I, yeah. I really hope that the that has to be the women they were writing about in, in, in uh, uh, telling the story of Code Girls in the context oh. of that book has to be... Uh, who they're paying homage to, and I, I hope because I can't remember. I, I read the book a while ago. I can't remember their names now, but some of them have have passed away. I mean, it was a long time ago. Most of them have, have passed, passed away. away. Absolutely, yeah. pay homage. That is, if you have not read Code Girls, like if it, like Paul's list of books that are related to cryptography, you got to mm -hmm. read Code Girls, and you have to read Steve. Levy, Steve Levy's uh, crypto. <laughs> Steve Le Levy's crypto. Stephen Levy. Stephen Levy. Am I saying his name right? Yeah. Stephen Levy. Probably not. As Stephen you know, Charles, Levy. I can't pronounce anyone's name right. Uh, <laughs> Stephen <laughs> Levy. Sure. sure. Close. Crypto, sure. crypto. Uh huh. And uh, Code Girls, for sure. Oh. So I can read the the information from the Postal Service about this. It says that during World War II, some 11,000 women helped to process and decipher an endless stream of enemy military messages. Both frustrating and exhilarating, their work was one of the conflict's best-kept secrets. These women helped to break and decipher the encryption systems that revealed vital shipping and diplomatic messages, built the machines that allowed cryptologists to break encrypted messages, and perform many other duties. Now, if you go into the stamp art, this is also pretty cool of the Postal Service because the stamp itself features an image from World War II era women accepted to volunteer for emergency service, WAVES, uh -huh. the acronym. It was a recruitment poster with an overlay of the characters from the purple code and in the pain selvage, so on the stamp, it also reveals this, the random letters that can be deciphered to re reveal keywords on the stamp itself. Oh, and what was the what wow. was the purple code? The purple code was 
a thing. It was a real thing. It was a yep. real code they deciphered. Was it a, was it a it, Japanese it was, code or a German? It was Japanese. Japanese. It was Japanese, Japanese right? Yeah. yeah. German was Enigma. Right. Um, and we'd broken both of them before World War II started. It's, it, what was interesting, to, was so many interesting things about that book, what was interesting to me is like the, these men and I mean, there was mostly women that were working because the men right. were off like fighting, but they were literally on the front lines too. Like they, while they didn't, like there wasn't bullets flying at them in the battlefield. They still felt the pressures of war in like, if we don't crack this code, the men that we love that are overseas right now, my, you know, the, my, my brother, my, my husband or whatever, like they could die. And like, if we crack this uh -huh. code, they might not but die. They, like weren't they, cr they weren't technically cracking the code. They, mm, I mean, yeah, it was, th there's, I they guess cracking hacking? the code for that day. They hacking were, the code? Hack, no, they were brute day, forcing, and they were doing yeah. it in, you know, they, they were multiprocessing. They were the multiprocessors. Mm -hmm. You know, DES was broken how many years ago because they, they, they split up the task of, you know, mm -hmm. doing all the, the brute forcing on what would have been one machine. They're like, well, let's split up and do it on a thousand right, machines. Right. I mean, that, right. but they were uh, basically a thousand individuals taking sure. their little piece it was brute force amazing work really exhaustive uh doing the exhaustive brute force now i want to get one of the like can we get like a poster on one of these stamps to put in the studio or something i'm like, sure I guess, I'm yeah, sure yeah we it's pretty cool yeah. yeah yeah let me see what they have it's pretty wild and uh while you're doing that uh jeff did you check out where they did the ceremony oh yeah i saw one of your favorite places yep. yeah Oh, the Cryptologic Museum. It mm -hmm. only reopened yeah. on October seventh, I think, or eighth. Eighteenth. They've totally redone the place, is from what I understand. I, I can't wait to go. Oh, check wow. it. Well, they're in the process of building an entire new building. I haven't driven by. I haven't been to it lately, but uh, yeah, they're 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 in the process of building a new Cryptologic Museum. I mean, the Cryptologic Museum that had been in existence was basically in an old. It was in an old hotel, motel. motel, right? That that was right mm -hmm. next to Fort Meade, right next to NSA. That the um, Russians bugged that motel. Is that the story? <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. I mean, it, you can't it, tell me it's classified still. Well, no, and, and it's been <laughs> bugging me because I'm like, I can't remember the name of the hotel. But I mean, it was a hotel that was you know, was a hotel or a motel? It was a motel, and it was <laughs> frequented. Uh, it was a hotel, by, motel, Holiday Inn. Which one was it? it was, was it a no it tell was motel? Not a ho it was not a Probably Holiday Inn. It was a motel. It was wow. a motel. <laughs> Ever been a, a, it was a, a motel. house to ease and the food just ain't no good? Um, <laughs> no, Surely you can't be serious. The motel, don't call me Shirley, uh -huh. was privately operated and at some point NSA bought it and operated operated it as a motel for, for Russian visitors. Diplom Russian diplomats. And yeah, it, 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 them. Was, was it the, was, there was some kind of, there was a lot of, there was some kind of James Bondish yeah. stuff going on. Well, anyway. if you can't get into the headquarters, go to the place right. where the people are spending the night. Is Tyler back? Wow. I'm, I'm Tyler? back. Oh, okay. Hey. Hey, oh, okay. Everything, <laughs> everything come out okay? Tyler? I want to segue yeah. into my story number 22, um, Office Online Server Remote Code Execution 23, Blue, B Blue Bleed, Microsoft Data Leak, or 24, Researchers Warn About a PowerShell Backdoor. Which one of those is most interesting, Tyler? Because they're all Windows-related I gotta imagine you probably read all three and familiar with it in your line of work. Yep. At least yep, within I, the next couple, I looked at last couple hours. The blue bleed one's interesting because there's so much hype about it. <clears throat> um, that one is like Microsoft left a storage blob exposed. There was a uh, permission in ACL on one of their Azure storage blobs uh, that had some procurement docs. They had some customer facing stuff. So there was there was quite mm -hmm. a bit of data in there. Um, SOC Radar, I believe, was who reported it to Microsoft, and they got it. You know, they got that permission closed down, and supposedly that was being decommissioned. The big hype over all of it is that Microsoft isn't handling it uh, as we would typically expect them to do uh, with good breach notification, what was in there, all the details. Um, but the, the data is, you know, having gone through some of the data, lots of Excel sheets, lots of PDFs, uh, lots of procurement stuff. There's some interesting clients in there with the uh, PII. There's email addresses. So Tyler, not Tyler, how horrible, much, but... How much of your day is spent going through leaks like this? A I feel lot. like you are the the <laughs> leak expert. Like you're the... The leak master? You're like the, the cybersecurity <laughs> plumber, man. Like you're all about the leaks. 
man, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. it's it's very very difficult. You you can learn a lot about companies. You can learn a lot about your adversaries. You can learn a lot about like what's being done between organizations and groups just from the leaks. So, yeah, I've got mm-hmm. like 96 terabytes of worth of leaks. It's uh, it's a lot to keep up. But with not just leaks, but Telegrams also like and, like people selling exploit kits. Like we learned about Black Lotus. Like that was covered in the. Mm-hmm mainstream cybersecurity news right like there's there's like a whole there's a whole industry (laughs) built around that there's a there's a lot i mean it takes a lot not doing it for my day job it takes a lot between all the personas Mm. uh the different hacking groups and forums you're in the different telegram gram channels you got to use you know different backstories that are well built over the years some of the the personas we have are you know over seven years old so like to maintain access and run in some of the circles that require you mean, vetting you mean bob, and, and you mean that, bob, it's hard you mean bob has all those personas. bob has a lot of things lot of that personas. are not his yeah. <laughs> right a lot of bobs out Jesus. there bob is mm-hmm. just busy bob's a busy man the bob's bob's busy yeah man. yeah the uh the powershell backdoor one's kind of interesting i i was you can get around AMSI, you can get around Defender. There's a lot of ways, uh, and we've seen PowerShell abused for the last you know, decade. Um, so this one was not something that was super interesting other than the fact of some tradecraft they were using with some, some VBSs and, and dumping uh, temp PS1s uh, using that VBS. So there was some interesting ways that they were leveraging PowerShell and a PowerShell backdoor for some stealth. Uh, but it wasn't anything that was super novel that we haven't used before. I mean, mm. we've we've seen these. We've there's lots of private code, lots of uh, public code out there that's kind of demonstrated these. So that one wasn't quite as interesting to me. Uh, one of the real interesting articles I read, I don't know if it's on yours, but I'll drop it in somewhere, uh, was on a VBS macro uh, to get to Ring Zero Rootkit. Now that was uh, an interesting read what? and was right up your alley of like. Someone took on the challenge of figuring out a way to get to kernel level root, root kit all with a, a macro, and that was terrifying. How so do you get? That was an interesting read. Do you have to? That load, is amazing. Yeah. Do you have to load other code? Like the macro is kind of like the jumping off point to load other code in into the kernel. Usually, usually the way that they did it, um, they leveraged a all the they leveraged the macro itself to get all the way to ring zero so wow. holy was shit. one of the most fascinating uh, articles i've read this week i think I, I posted it on my twitter um but i will link to it in the article and make sure it's on the discord that's pretty amazing um I'm trying to remember what other ones uh, were out there that i'd read that were very interesting uh ghost rider if you guys are in offensive space, uh, Spectre Ops mm-hmm. guys have been working on this for but quite a while. This really is, cool. Ghost Rider, Ghost Rider is, this is like, uh, I think Dan DeClos from Plex Tracks coming on in a couple of weeks. But this is like kind of one of those open source alternatives to what Dan does. I feel like Dan covers this really, really yeah. well in his and in his like product. the difference is like you pay for what you get. And yeah. like the Spectre Ops yeah. guys have done a great job. This is for red teamers. It makes, you know, writing a report much easier. It adds a lot for infrastructure management, making sure your domains aren't burned, uh, looking for categorized stuff. So it does some additional things for uh, offensive operations, but uh, you cannot beat like Plex Track and the ability to, to out- output very polished reports from a professional standpoint. So Dan has, really a, Dan has an amazing so team. I caught up with Dan today um, in, in prep for him coming on the show, uh, and they're they're doing it's still, of course, amazing work over there. But what what I was interested in Ghost Writer is it kind of brought up like yeah, there's open source alternatives to to most things that we use today, right? Um, mm-hmm. But they brought up in, in, in uh, of the the deconfliction, right? When you're doing an offensive penetration test or offensive assessment of any kind, you are likely to trigger some kind of anomalous event, and then the blue team has to go, wait, was that my internal pen test team? Was that my external pen test team? Or shit, was that an attacker? And like, no, 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 it's not an attacker. It's the unofficial pen test team. It's the unofficial <laughs> pen test. Or that's a great point. Internal pen test team, external pen test team, or unofficial pen test team. Who triggered the alert? And so now you're going back to your pen testers. Well, at least your official ones, right? And you're going, <laughs> was this you? And as a pen tester, you're like, shit, I don't know. Unless you've got some kind of tooling that's like, yeah, that's is, is that a documented right. part of incident response is to always ask, is this somebody pen testing us before you actually <laughs> respond to the event? I think it's similar it's good, like it's when you get hacked and you're like, oh, that was a honeypot. 
<laughs> like, oh, oh no, that was that was just our internal pen testing. We're really we're really not hacks. It's totally cool. Mature, mature companies really do need to know like all the IOCs, all the infrastructure you've used for after action incidents, as well as deconfliction during the white cell, is, right. is part of a very good operation that should happen for most places. However. Uh, we've seen a lot of loosey goosey pen test companies not keep track of things other than like some IP addresses of callbacks. Like it doesn't serve your, your customers very well. If you're not, you know, providing IOCs, providing the base 64 blobs, look at, giving them the encryption keys, giving them all of the infrastructure after the fact doing deconfliction with the white cell. Also, you have to do very carefully, right? So the blue yeah, team doesn't just I block guess. all your stuff and then, and then they don't get it, their money out of the assessment. You have to kind of take that stance and make sure you preempt that with the, the pre-engagement stuff. So there's a lot to to kind yeah. of do that. But Tyler, but, and, Tyler, and, Tyler and Charles, but hold on, Tyler and Charles, this makes your jobs really hard as pen testers because an attacker, they don't give two shits whether or not like they're documenting exactly how they got in and if they're leaving a trace and being able to tie it back, right? Like attackers have a goal; they want to compromise their goal. I mean, for them, hopefully, they're documenting what they do that's successful for their own purposes. But like, they don't care about tying it back to anything that had to help the company. But when you're a pen tester, someone's paying you to come in. You should. Yeah. Your job is much harder because you're like, hold on, from the time the clock starts ticking when I'm doing the pen test from the finish, I have to know everything that I did, everything that my tools did, every piece yeah, of straight. infrastructure I had. Right. I have to document it. And if I was yeah. successful, when someone comes back and asks me a question like, is this your C2 server? You better have an answer fast. Well, and if you, if, yeah. but that makes your job really hard. Raise, as an your, raise your hand if you're a pen tester and you've ever been accused of something that's went wrong in the network. And, the and that's the well, other reason why. Guys, yeah, but to know. Jeff's your point, that's the other reason why you've got to document all your stuff because you're, you're like, whoa, 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 wait, I was coming from these IP addresses. My attacks had this kind of signature. I hit these systems, not those systems. I hit these applications, not you. Have to document uh -huh. everything that you do and have a record of that. That makes your job harder as an attacker. But not, so, a, not only that, you you have a lot of places that you actually have to submit op plans for and and have yeah. your mm -hmm. your day planned out of what command you're going to run, what's been right. approved or disapproved, what targets you're going to do. You do this very stealthily and like keeping track of all those targets, knowing what your your plan is, what IOCs are being left behind. If you especially if you're doing things like misinformation or misattribution, or you're operating as an APT that you know could cause a war. These things are places that you don't do things without approval, without knowing every step that your tool is taking, as well as right. knowing how to clean those up and what artifacts you're leaving behind, not just on disk, but in memory. And those are very important. Uh, good attackers will know how to handle themselves well and, and have that OPSEC available. See, this, this would slow me down. And I, I find myself asking questions like, wait, no, this like audio device in Linux, I had these commands and these files that I edited to like fix this issue with my audio that like takes like the rear sound from the front sound and like mixes it all down into one. I'm like, I know I fixed that problem and shit. I've looked for, I've looked for that solution for like months and I'm like, I can't, I didn't document it. I fixed it and that's, and I didn't document it. And I'm like, <laughs> fuck. And that's the thing. And that's the thing. So like with, with pen tests, right? For me personally, I try to treat whenever I'm on a pen test engagement, the theme of law and order starts working through my head. So yeah, you gotta have a like record of every yeah yeah. So you know, I feel I'm sorry, like I I'm it. detective tutorial, right? But I, it like tutorial. it like kill, but it kills the mood, man. Like for me, like some of it kills the mood because I'm like, oh, like I want to go make love to my wife, but hold on, like I gotta write down everything that I do. <laughs> right? Wait, yeah. Like that kills the, the mood thing. if you had to do that. <laughs> but, Dude, but here's I used the to thing, teach right? Digital forensics. You look at it from a standpoint, like say, hey, you know what? Each day, you're trying to accomplish goals. Like, okay, this like a list of commands that I'm going to run, right? Right. If you find something at that point, stop. Document what you did. Make sure it's on documentation, not on your computer, but on a share. Yeah. So your so team just in case see your it, device yeah. dies. Yeah. Yep. You're you're still okay. Or in I know the case on your BSD machine, you recompile the kernel and it doesn't come back. Oh Jesus! Oh, I have Notion. You know, I used to teach digital. No, Notion is awesome, <laughs> and yeah. it was. I have Notion with my have, configuration backup. I used to have these uh, people that, when you teach digital forensics, you'd be or do uh -huh. digital forensics, 
He'd be like, all right, you know, you need to document very carefully everything you do, every step, every tool, everything that happens, every right. result, every consequence, everything. And so I would always have a student to go, okay, how do I know when I'm done? Oh, that's an easy one. If you think you've documented it thoroughly enough, go back and perform another, another level of detail. Mm -hmm. And they, oh, okay. Now it never occurred to them that I just gave them a recursion exercise, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> but like, seriously, but, if you think you've documented enough, and this works for pen testing as well, if you think mm -hmm. you've documented enough, you haven't, do more. Mm -hmm. It's quite literally that simple. Because at some point, somebody's gonna ask that question, was this you? Mm. And the problem is proving a negative is really a bitch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to prove the null hypothesis. Yes. Fuck yeah. So <laughs> you, you, you've got to be able to show, say, I was over here working on this stuff. I had nothing to do with that piece over there. And if you can mm -hmm. document down to the what you were doing at what time, on what mm -hmm. system, with what commands, you can show. If you can't. And this is why screenshots are important. Yep. Because if okay. you don't have a screenshot, it didn't happen. Yep. The, I, 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 I used to use something called strings. I, I, I suspect that's still a thing that's available on most Linux. Best reverse engineering tool on the planet, Jeff. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys cover uh, Mark of the Web, the zero day exploit one? No. No. Mm, wait, that was wait, a good one. Uh, Windows, Windows this week, there was, uh, we've seen oh, some actors hold leveraging hold JavaScript. Time out. time out. Mark of the Web. Explain that to us, Tyler, because I was reading this. And I kind of okay, forgot so about the inside of the, the alternate data stream, whenever you download a file, uh, there's a... Oh, well, hold on. Well, we're, talking on mark. we're talking on Windows, because Linux and yes. PSD doesn't give a shit what you download. <laughs> yeah, any, anytime you download a file on the internet, worse. it puts a mark on it, essentially. There's, there's a lot of detail in how it applies a mark. And ever since uh, we've seen, you know, Office documents and, and other files start to get uh, more stringent. So the mark of the web ends up on downloaded files. Now, a lot of the, so wait, the Windows on, but hold on, uh, security hold on, controls... Sorry, hold on, Tyler. What right, is the on. mark of the web? Hold on, hold on, back up. But I, I want to ask that qu Jeff's question in a different way. When I download a file on Windows, it's doing some kind of binary analysis or static analysis on that to determine if that contains code that could be run in the context of the web, like HTML, JavaScript, CSS, stuff like that. Kind of. So it puts a mark on any file downloaded that is that Microsoft has deemed should have a mark on it from mm -hmm. the internet. So if a file is downloaded, it doesn't do any analysis. If it's downloaded, it just the says mark it, come, it came it, from the internet. Or not. It came from the internet. Therefore, it's got a tag. It came from the internet. Yep, and that's for right. certain MIME types or file types or PE headers. Like there's there's ways that it happens and, and does that in line. What uh, what is the nature of the, of the mark? The is, is it simply a, a flag? Is, is it's a one, not a zero? It, it's it's it gets a little bit complicated. Where it puts it, it's it's almost like an ACL that applies with a flag that's set on the alternate data stream of the file mm -hmm. bytes for the whole file itself. And so it has a way to identify that, put it in there, and you can't just take the mark of the web off, right? Um, what attackers have been doing though, and this is why ISOs, this is why you see a lot of the malware and ISOs mm. coming in, they've found right. ways that files within inside of an ISO do not end up with the mark of the web. So you can send in a Word doc that was downloaded from the internet inside of an ISO and therefore it won't receive the mark of the web and thus will execute without the big warning that it's got a mark of the web on and it, just, right? Like this from the internet so is dangerous. Just so we're clear, ISOs were referring to like a virtual CD-ROM. Because like, Correct. when's the last time yeah. you bought a computer with a CD-ROM drive? Everybody's been using like, ISOs for if it, had a, if it had a turbo button, DVD-ROM. If it had a turbo button a on turbo it, it button. probably had a CD-ROM <laughs> drive in it. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so the Mark of the Web, they found a way, uh, this has been a big thing for attackers, is to get files in without the Mark of the Web so you don't get the big warning so that your malware gets executed and it can drop you know, something to disk. Uh, one of the ways that came out this week was there's uh, JavaScript files, which always have the Mark of the Web, You know, same with HTAs, EXEs, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Word docs, Excel docs, all those things, they, they end up with the Mark of the Web and then they don't allow the execution and they have a zone identifier tied to them that marks them as dangerous. Uh, so the JavaScript files, when they got downloaded, uh, attackers were leveraging these JavaScript files and, and putting the signed, there's a signed binary uh, location in there. So they were leveraging the, um, I'm trying to remember what it was, it was a signed, 
signature. It was a signed signature. So they embed a, a signed signature that's malformed. If the, the signature was malformed, that took off the mark of the web for whatever reason, and those JavaScript files were making it in, and that was one of the ways that they were getting execution from uh, straight JavaScript files. So very interesting zero day that uh, I believe was fixed. Uh, but at your perimeter, obviously, you should be, you know, not allowing those mind types, watching for JavaScript, and then uh, for your forensics and IR, maybe looking for recent JavaScripts over the last month or two um, that came in because that, that mark of the web was uh, getting bypassed. So you couldn't rely on that for, for execution protection. I think it's a good time to bring up my story number 16 because we, we really need comprehensive security. And this article has documented four ways to achieve comprehensive security. I mean, this is really the only article we need to cover this week. <laughs> Just four ways. That's it. like, it's four it, ways. It, it certainly and, appears to be buzzword compliant. Right? And so <laughs> now you're on like the edge of your seat. Like what's, what's, the, what's the four ways? So the first way, I know you're all like, mm -hmm. you, you can't wait to hear this, right? Is a commit to a zero trust strategy. I mean, if we all just had a commitment to a zero trust strategy, so time. that's the first fundamental thing. Everyone knows to a comprehensive security strategy. Comprehensive security means the first thing is zero trust. You mean hardening. You mean system hardening. <laughs> or is it mean hardening? defense in depth? Defense but, in depth. But, like, uh -uh. I, but also, like, <laughs> zero trust is a buzzword. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but if you no, there's a if, definition now. It's not just a buzzword. Okay. Process. There's pillars. It's right. I don't want to poo poo, yeah, but I don't want to poo poo it totally because, like, I think it kind of speaks to, like, I shouldn't trust the software on my system. I shouldn't trust the firmware on my system. I shouldn't trust the signing and certificates on my system. Right. No. That segues into a, another story, which I think is really interesting too. That I want to make sure we cover. But like, it does. It is a buzzword. And I think it's overused, and I think a lot of companies have gone, oh, like we we do like zero trust, right? Mm -hmm. It's okay. great for marketing. It's great marketing, right? But mm -hmm. if you think of it in the context of, like, I really need to think about what I trust and validate mm -hmm. what I trust and what I like, go through the validation process to determine trust. I think that speaks yeah. to like the the buzzword we're trying to create of zero trust, right? So I don't. I don't disagree with I don't disagree with, with the strategy, right? Like I've, I'm working on this piece, and you've heard me talk about this, right? Like I install software on Linux, and like mm -hmm. I don't, I I don't think that I trust anything more than anything else, but I'm still trusting something. So like whether my software comes from Apt and maybe it comes from Canonical, it maybe it comes from other people that have Apt repositories, or it's Snap, or it's Flatpak, or it's in the Arch repository or BSD mm -hmm. ports. And you mentioned BSD, it reminded yep. me, Charles, of like ports, right? Like yep. all of that is that you're extending trust to people and organizations that you have no idea what they're doing. And right? You're just like, you know what? Meet in life, yeah. Right? Like you, you folks made this software package. You could be one individual, it could be a group of individu individuals. Mm -hmm. And like, thank you for making this software. Back to our discussion of like, Oh, if you make the software open source, make sure you got MFA enabled and you're following the OWAS top ten and all this other yeah. stuff. Like, you made this like isn't I, MFA one of the four? I can do Pac-Man install Google Chrome and mm -hmm. magically on Arch and Manjaro, I have Chrome and that's awesome. But like someone put that together and I have to trust they didn't put tamper with the supply chain, right? right? And so like I have to extend that trust. And zero trust just says like you should question that. Right, like how is a different thing that I think we all kind of take issue between buzzword and actual practical usage of right. it. But like, I need some better way to validate that, maybe other than a, a signature or a cryptographic hash, which can also be forged, which is where I, what really grinds yeah. my gears. I can say, look, yeah, like I, I used whatever to get Google Chrome, and I, mm -hmm. I validated the hash. Or there was a cryptographic signature, two different things, right? And it said that, like, the Chrome really came from you. But, like, if you're compromised, why would an right. attacker also compromise the, the hash and or the cryptographic signature of that software and go, like, you're going to run yeah. my code? Well, like, Paul, well, how do you Paul, say Paul. whose code is whose code? How is it your code versus the attacker's code? Paul, the problem is you're talking about zero trust software. Correct. Zero trust technically right now is more about infrastructure and architecture, not software. 
Okay. So when you say zero, I agree with you. Don't get me wrong. That is an incredibly valid and, and well said point about zero trust, the, the software, the packaging, everything else. But um, realistically, the way people are using it, it's more about zero trust networks, zero trust architecture, zero trust Chips. systems, frameworks, and applications. Yeah. In my own systems, when they have to trust each other, I have a APIs and they have to trust each other to run code. How do I validate that that application hasn't been compromised, that that application is secure, that that application is not doing something it's not supposed to be doing? Same thing. Dude, different you have to, same thing. You have to concept, check Discord. Right? Yeah. You have to check Discord. Gauss has put in uh, it's zero faith architecture, not zero trust. Yeah, that's <laughs> oh, a great man. quote. That's, that's a great that, line. It, yeah, that's zero faith. Ah. Yeah, because uh, think about it. That's just like when people talk about like machine learning and AI, right? Who's wh who's going to police the people who are policing the people? Like, you know, like with, with AI. So the who compiler can, really that them? compiles the compiler. Oh, my God. We're back to Ken Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> I want to reach out. I want to reach out to Ken Thompson. Try and get him. On. I He's I think he's I think I looked it up. I think I, I think I was curious to see like mm -hmm. Carnegie. Richie and Thompson, like they're, they're, I think they're all in their 80s. I think it's Ken that was yeah, like pretty sure at least one of them's dead. Is one of them, yes, as one of them, Dennis Richie is dead. Dennis Richie, Richie, Richie died. died. When I said that, he passed I, away in 2011, you're right. right before or after Steve Jobs. I remember okay. that, yes, year. but yeah. Brian and Ken, I believe, are both still like in their 80s. Like, there was this really funny story about Brian Kernigan where he had this amazing patch for something. And he wanted to release it. And he's like, can somebody help me figure out how Git works so I, I can do that? And I'm like, dude, <laughs> totally fine. I have to look yep. up the documentation for Git like every single fucking time, dude. Like we I all do. <laughs> and if yeah. Brian has to do that, I, I feel a whole lot better. I don't feel bad. Yeah. yeah. I feel better for myself already. Right? <laughs> yeah. There is a 30-year-old like would... version control system that you have down pat. <laughs> but for Git, you have to look up the documentation you every time. Vented but Unix and C. Like, I, I'll give you a pass. You, Get his but even then, they invented Golang. Yes. Yes. Which is amazing. Still do it. Amazing. <laughs> anyway, but the second so, thing is... So that's so one whole, of the four is one zero of the four, trust. Zero trust. <laughs> right. we, we could spend and the whole show on zero trust. Right. Number oh, yeah. two, manage compliance, <laughs> risk, and privacy. And they took two paragraphs to totally solve that entire set of problems. Three. No, no, hold on. Hold on. Let's all agree. Compliance, risk, and policy are three totally privacy. different answers. Privacy. 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 What did yeah. I say? You said policy. Well, policy. policy. Sorry. Policy. Privacy. Policy. Compliance, privacy. risk, and privacy are three totally different things. Yep. Yeah. Totally different things. Oh, yeah. But if you nail those, you're on your way to achieve comprehensive well, What does it mean security. to manage compliance? Speaking oh my god someone... wait, wait, wait. sorry 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 i have to say this i know what this article reminds me of it's like it's been bugging me do you know what this article reminds me of the underpant gnomes the what the underpants gnomes you know one steel underwear two yes. question mark three profit like <laughs> if you can do these four things oh my goodness oh it gets better number three is use a no, no 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 we're not moving oh hold on jeff yeah. wants to what weigh does in it on... mean to manage compliance yeah. Uh, it means I Eat fill out a question. Hold on, I can answer this. It means you fill out a questionnaire and you check a bunch of boxes. Oh, I'm gonna hit you when I get up to Rhode Island. <laughs> I'm gonna, gonna hit you so freaking hard when I get up to Rhode Island. <laughs> and, and that's good. Oh, the mm. fact that I struck a nerve with Josh with that, like, <laughs> made my night. That was amazing. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, in the article, it looks like they describe it as just using a tool that translates complicated regulations and standards into simple language. Oh, my God. That triggers Josh even more. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, uh, now Josh Did you have my eye roll back too, here, uh, Josh? Josh his like, you hold on. Dude, Josh and Jeff are going to go smack the author of this article. Mark Rhode Island is going to be interesting. Oh, but, so this article was written by Mark Simos, the lead cybersecurity architect for Microsoft. By the way, and idiot. Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> oh wow! Shots uh -oh. fired! Oh. Shots fired! All right, we Ooh. know who's on the guest list. I mean, this show I will think, never yeah. be sponsored by Microsoft. Thank you very much. I would have been a little, little more <laughs> forgiving if what if what he had said for this is stop doing this by hand, leverage freaking tools so you can get your arms around it more easily. That would I be wouldn't fine. trivialize it the way he did. I mean, it's like 
yeah, don't do this shit by hand anymore. I kind of like for compliance, just checking. Yeah. Like it feels good to check. Just I, check the box. I'm, I'm, you know, war, war games mentality. I'm still kind of like I like the manual processes at some level. Well, no, there's but there's there's a problem with scaling them. That's you know you you can only have so many human beings doing the manual stuff, and as we get Agreed. more and more, I like how you guys pick requirements. Guys and gals picked compliance and didn't ask like how do you manage risk? Well, we're that's, we're, that's, that's the, the deeper se- question. That's the second here. question. That's the deeper question here. You got to go through the first game, Vulcan's <laughs> <Yeah>. maze. <laughs> but I, I, I but the implication here is that. At least the way I read this is that mm-hmm. organizations view <laughs> compliance, you know, any any regulatory standards that they have to address, they right. they view that as adversarial and and problematic and something that they have to get by, rather than embracing it for what it is. I mean, compliance is basically a measurement. How well are you doing the things that you're? So, if doing? you're managing compliance, aren't you managing risk? Not necessarily. No. And if you're managing risk, aren't you managing compliance? I don't think you manage risk. I think you, at the, you know, uh, in an ideal, there, there is there is a subset of tools called risk management. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. That's true. But there are. They are managing but what risk, are they? But or are they simply directing the strategy of how to work with risk? I think there. I, I think there are attempts important. to quantify risks so you yes. can come up with some sort of you know. You have a scale one to a hundred, and you've and you score thirty two. Is that good, bad, or indifferent? I don't know. I still think and it's a bunch of people is, checking a bunch of different boxes. It, that's what it ends up being pragmatically, <laughs> but that's so not that's not but, hard. Do you want me to smack them for you in, in, <laughs> please, in, on please. air in studio please. for you? Jason? I am on oh, board with man. that man. <laughs> yeah. I am on board with that shit. This is Go getting wild. Oh, this is wildly entertaining. <laughs> I mean, so let me ask the question this way. This is a serious question. If you're not, no, no serious. If you're there's not, there's nothing if, serious about me covering this, putting this article in here for us to cover. By the if, way, if there is, if there is this perception, and let's say it's legitimate, that compliance is a, a is a roadblock, a stumbling block, a, a, a burr in the saddle, a, a, a necessary evil, something that 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 gets in the way of you doing your job. How do you know? How do you have any clue or idea that what you're doing is adequate, effective, enough, working, not working, if not for some sort of standard to measure against, which is what right. compliance is in essence. Compliance is simply to make sure that you're doing your job properly in the way that you said you would do your job and that you're being effective at those things. So even if and, that no and, longer has full effectivity and what it- what you're facing, though, I mean, uh, I think it's a different story. No, but that's I, a different but, story. But Mandy, to your point, I think I think it does. I think I'm overly harsh and critical of compliance standards, right? To your point, Mandy, I think they are relevant to what we do in security Please. and managing risk. I think it is a component. If you had to say, I want to have a comprehensive security program, and you were like, mm-hmm. well, compliance just isn't part of this this equation, you would be wrong. Right? I've told like my clients for a year, it's for, part of it. forget compliance, forget PCI, tell me what you're doing to secure everything. I'll make it fit into compliance. It will if, fit in compliance. If, if I you're, agree. If I you're agree. confident with yeah. what you're doing from a security perspective, stand by it, back it up, tell me what you're doing, I'll make it fit. Yeah, I agree. Don't get hung up no, on the language yeah. of the particular compliance if it, You're right, if it goes the other no. way, it can work to your detriment, right? But if yeah. you're just like... Right, but I, I, yeah. I, but, but the, our industry has built this, this, this perception that compliance is a necessary evil, but it has nothing to do with security. Mm-hmm. It has everything to do with security. It's a measurement of security. How do you measure your security if not for some sort of compliance standard. All right, number three. Use oh, a- you're not even going to answer the question. No. Number three. <laughs> you spend way too much time on yeah. number two. We're number two. We still have more stories to cover. Number three. Use a combination of XDR and SIM tools. Not EDR, but XDR. XDR. XDR mm. is the is the is the it's MDR. It's X. It's EDR. It's all, it's the all the DRs. It's all that, the above. That's what XDR is. It's infinity stuff that feeds detection and response it's it's actually in my opinion the essence of what security is which is detection finding out something that's weird that's going on that you need to respond to because that's where the attacks are happening 
I agree with the that. detection, correlation, and response. I this mean, one's not that's bad. That's the only <clears throat> thing right. that's really security. <clears throat> this one's not bad. It uses a lot of buzzwords like XDR and SIM tools and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the pen testers of the world, attackers of the world are like, if they can detect what I'm doing. And sometimes that's, and if someone from, someone from Microsoft wrote this, right? Like they made Sysmon. Like, yeah, there's ways to bypass Sysmon, but like if the only thing you're doing to monitor your Windows systems is collecting Sysmon and analyzing that, I think you're doing pretty good. Charles, Tyler, like, is that like table stakes? Like, that's but it's hard bad. to answer that without it, talking about risk and no, very well, true. Man, I right. So, so for example, like, perfect example, right? Like, um, as we know today, a lot of like, without obfuscating any type of code, C sharp code is 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 being caught on the daily, right? Mm -hmm. um, figured this out with, um, of course, Sharp Hound, right? Um, just recently, I just came off of a test where I was able to use Rust Hound for the first time and extract. And I know some of it just happens to be Rust. Trust me, if it was Golang, I would have said the same thing. But with Rust Hound, where it had an EDR running on it, I was able to run it with no problems and extract information from Active Directory and dump it into Bloodhound so I can get all my information, right? Now, I'm willing to bet probably next patch Tuesday or whatever else or next update that comes out, that Rust Hound will probably not work. Yeah, but what what if you're looking and at the behavior I guess Sysmon looks at what a, If you're looking at the behavior, Sysmon then looks, it's Sysmon a different looks story. at more of like a process, right? I guess the next level from that is what's that behavior. process doing? Behavior. Like what's that process doing yeah. from differently from what that process normally does? So like, I, well, it doesn't I think that's where EDRs what, are moving I, anyway. I don't care what language, whether it's COBOL, Rust, or whatever. If yeah. you're running a, a program, one that program, maybe that's a new program, maybe you're injecting code into an already running program, that program does something different. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. Sysmon or some other level of monitoring that goes, that's doing something different. And that's always a cat and mouse game, sure. Right. But I think if, if you were to have a comprehensive security program, it would maybe not XDR SIM tools, but looking at behavior of what what is different, right? Right. Like that's always where I come down to with like binaries and drivers. Like everyone's mm -hmm. you're running programs and you're loading drivers and all that stuff, but like what's doing stuff it's not supposed to? That's a really hard question to answer, and you got your work cut out for you as a defender. But it's also like yeah. it's an answerable question in a lot of scenarios. But, but, but it's the stuff that we need to focus on as right. security professionals. It's the stuff that's not normal. Right. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and over the years, and I've been working with you know, customers for too long, the, the, be the most secure organizations I ever worked for, there were people there that were, for whatever they were responsible for, they had an, A, an attitude of, it's not going to happen on my watch. And they had whatever they had to be able to detect the not normal. Yeah. And and they also they 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 knew enough of what was normal. It was mm -hmm. it's the NCIS Gibbs gut. You know they they, they there's something weird here. But it's also what I talked about last week. It's the Chris Brenton one through ten, right? One being the most normal event on your network in the world. Ten being holy shit, we're compromised six ways to Sunday. <laughs> you spent right. most of your time in the like four through seven going like should that be on my networks and systems or not right but like, this is where right. but this is where i i i would come back to you need to have manual processes in terms of people look it, it might be a manual process to look at the output of all the automated tools because yeah Lee, no, yes agreed. i acknowledge yeah. you, you've got to use automation to to get your handle around this but you still have to have a brain and a human and a person that's saying exactly eh, and the tool something help weird here Need, yeah 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 because that's the that was the narrative remember that was the narrative for a while i don't know if there still is the narrative yeah we're going to automate pen testing bullshit <laughs> you can't good luck you with can't. that you can oh, automate yeah. a lot of things that pen testers do yes you can automate yeah, a lot of you, the repetitive 
motions, the low level scanning, the yes, yeah, so there's uh, absolutely the, the it's appropriate to automate the manual tasks. I mean, the example that I've yeah. given, I've probably done it on the air before. One of the last pen tests that I did before I decided to like I'm going to do something different was I was working with another guy. We were at a client site and we were inside and we were trying to see what we could do. And I found a lot of Unix systems that were uh, exposing <laughs> X. And so I was manually running X keys and, and mm -hmm. gosh, what's the, you know, I was doing the, the capture of the keystrokes and, and the, and the monitor. Yeah, through X forwarding. Yeah. And, yeah. and, well, cause X, X and had, I, X and had I, no authentication. And I compared, right? like just, I, I, right. you know, at some point I went with the other guy I was with, happened to be Hank, the Hap Linux Hank. And I'm like, yeah, I found a couple servers that had X exposed. So I'm capturing. He's like, oh, yeah, I saw that. I wrote a quick, I want to say it was a Python script. It mm -hmm. might have just been a shell script. He said, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I set up some automation and I found like 90 servers doing it. Mm -hmm. And I'm capturing on all of it. I'm like, okay, I'm done. You know, that's where automation is appropriate. Right. Right. The, 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 the trick with automation is, is, yes, it's appropriate. Yes, it's necessary. But you still have to have the human element that's analyzing mm -hmm. oh, the, agree. Out, the output and what, what's there. And, and the risk and where I'm concerned about automation is so many companies, because they don't have that guy, that person, that gal, that, mm -hmm. that it, it, it has got, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to happen on my watch. They've got the, mm -hmm. the, the personal investment in it that um, all you do is rely on the automation and you let the automation tell you what's wrong and what's not. You can fly under the radar. You can, you, you know, the, the, the hackers mm -hmm. and the bad guys can, they can learn and they, and they can, if they suspect that you're using a certain automation tool that's capturing a certain thing, they're going to learn how to adjust, adjust to it, go under the radar or, do it enough so that what they're doing, which is abnormal, right, becomes considered normal. But so I think we're, <clears throat> I think we're kind of backing up the number three. The number four is use MFA whenever and wherever possible. And I think this is a, ironically, in an it depends kind of situation, right? <laughs> it depends yeah. on what your other factors are for authentication, in my mind, right? Because mm -hmm. I think they all. I think in today's world, they carry a different weight. I think there's a huge difference between a basic SMS-based, clear text, easily spoofable. There's plugs and teenagers running into AT and T and Verizon stores and into you know doing these SMS you know attacks. Right. That has become, in my mind, lower hanging fruit to conduct these attacks. Versus, I've got a certificate on a TPM that's evaluating behavior and I'm incorporating that in my authentication process. I think there's a sliding scale here. I don't think today you can say use MFA. I think you have to qualify <laughs> that and to be like, you have to use like really good MFA. Well, like everything else, like everything else, don't think that you can use a certain thing and it's a silver bullet. It's a panacea. Mm -hmm. If yeah. I use that, it's I, not the only thing I, he did. I, I, it, it, I don't have to think about defense, it anymore. In Mark laid out four things and MFA was not his, his only thing. Right. But I want to uh, kind of extend what Mark is saying to be like, not just use MFA, but like use like effective MFA. But I also agree with Mark's point. Use it wherever possible i would say use it everywhere i think some of the early attacks that pen testers were exploiting was yeah you've got like two-factor authentication on this service but not this other service so like it doesn't matter if if you're improving your authentication in authorization in this manner in this service but this other service that goes to the same back end isn't implementing MFA or a weaker MFA, but this attackers right, are going to exploit right. that. But this it's goes like the, to, what you're saying goes to a principle, and I don't I don't have a, a buzzword for it, but making it making it more making it harder and making it more trouble than it's worth. Correct. Uh, you know, I I would definitely get behind that if if you know what I was saying earlier. If you if you put something like MFA in place, which I agree with, and you make it um that much you know not that the the mfa that you're using doesn't have attacks against it and there is a way to exploit it um but 
if you, if you're making it if you're making the effort on the attacker's part that much harder, right? They're more likely going to move on and and, mm -hmm. and, and go I'll back mark up on this one: having MFA versus not having it, right? Significant yes, advantage, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Your next right. level is like having really good MFA. Josh, did you so, have a, so there's, a hold there's, on? Hold on, there's a, hold there's on, a couple Josh. Things here hold then. on, hold on, Josh, and then Lee. I, I, I've got to run in just a minute, so I just want to get this out there. All of the points at a very high level that Mark Simos has brought out are valid. Okay, you've got to work on compliance, you've got to work on risk, you've got to work on privacy, on MFA, on you know XDR and SIM. Uh, these are all good stuff, but there's a biggest, a bigger problem that he's simply not addressed at all. It, it seems to not even be there in his thought process. And that problem is you have to have an integrated strategy to use all of these things with the security people, with the compliance people, with the risk people, with the operations people, and with the business people to actually handle your business along with your security. So Josh, your compliance, but your basically what you're saying is security is a process. Oh my God, what a thought. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's no, a valid point. It's a valid point. Well, I, and, I, and, all and, the and to summarize the it differently, don't think you can do these four things and be good. And you're done. Yeah. Right. Yeah, correct. Ho hold on, Lee. Well said. Hold Thank on, you. Lee. But Lee, yeah. So, so I had a, I had a couple things here. One is the current catchphrase is phishing resistant MFA, which is basically use don't use stupid MFA that people you know that SMS can get. Although I actually yeah. think it's better than nothing. But SMS not is better than nothing. But there's better things yeah, than but, SMS, right? But the the other thing about it is these of these four points, the XDR and MFA are both components in zero trust. So he's really only got two points. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think, though, back to Josh's point, you need to create a roadmap of how you're how you're going to do all this stuff. What's your strategies? Where you where think what matters? Um, otherwise, you're just buying stuff that's going to be shelfware. You're going to implement ten percent of seven products, and that's all you're going to do, uh -huh. which is interesting. No, I think that's a great point, Lee, and we see that all too often. Well, ten, you know, Im implementing. 40 product. I mean, the number yeah. of products that we implement in the Fortune 1000, if you look at the number of products they have, it's oftentimes quoted as being like more than 40 security products. And if you're only using uh, 10... It's got to be way more than 40. <laughs> modest <laughs> estimate, right? <laughs> if you're only using 10% of the functionality, on average, thank you, Josh, of all those, right, you're doing yourselves a disservice. And I often hear, you know, uh, Charles and Tyler weigh in on this, right? Uh -huh. When you go do, when you, you do a pen test and you're like, yeah, like I got in and like I noticed, cause you notice as a pen tester, like you got this defensive technology. Had right. you configured that like correctly, like really like, like put some effort into it. Much like we do as nerds when we work with our own technology, like right. you, you get out of something, what you put into it, right? As my grandfather used to always say, like, so like when I use Linux or I use this, whatever esoterics, not even esoterics, I use this software, like I got to put some investment uh -huh. into that, whether it's audio or video editing software, or whether it's a pen test tool or whether it's a defensive tool, like I got to put some effort into using that tool effectively. Charles right. is out there reading a man page a day to use Linux or Unix effectively, <laughs> yeah. right? On the defensive side, if you've adopted this technology, whether it's an EDR, whether it's an MFA tech, whatever it is, like you got to put some effort into that. And it, if yeah. if that effort only is the effort you're putting in only yields a ten percent usage of that technology, Charles and Tyler and whatever are gonna walk in and be like, yeah, no, that that's not enough. But if I got whatever, there's over forty EDRs in the world, right? Pick any one. If I put a lot of effort into that EDR, probably gonna be in pretty good shape, right? Like. Yeah, it's uh, be not difficult. all EDRs are created equal. Like there's a sliding scale and we all kind of have our favorites, but like Oh yeah. There's certainly a subset that if you took those and put effort into them, you're gonna make an attacker's lives pretty miserable. Right. Oh right? yeah. Charles um, said Charles said, Oh yeah. Right? Like you do the same thing, right? To go back to what um Jeff said earlier, right? It's the this is not gonna happen on my watch mentality, right? Yep. Same thing. Flip it on the attacker side, right? I will not be denied mentality. Right. Yeah. Right. As opposed to, and there's probably some attackers out there that just say, oh, well, they got EDR. I didn't get in. Okay, cool. I'm done. Well, you know, no, no, no. but yeah. to that point, Charles, how many, you know, <laughs> right. we're talking about the difference between 
uh, you know, professional pen testers. We're, we've been hired to be the bad guy versus right. the real bad guys. And how many of the real bad guys are going to like, uh, you know, dig in and like, oh, I'm going to get you. you. You've made it challenging versus, eh, let's just move on to the next guy, the next organization. Which they will. Which, uh, they which absolutely they, which will. They, which they will because, again, like, like, like we're like you were discussing earlier, um, they'll probably be like, okay, it's not worth my time. Okay, let me move on. Um, if I can get like what well, was like a thousand cards over here versus this one, they're gonna go for the one thousand. Right. That's just like if you walk through the front door. If it's easier to walk through the front door, you're just gonna walk through the front door. You're not gonna try to find the the back door. Right. Yeah, you're gonna try like, the, front door. Right. the back door's locked. I'm gonna break up my lock pick set, right? <laughs> and, right, and just and, go and through all the complicated into steps. the camera system so no one sees me lock picking that. But I can just walk into the front door, right? Right. Oh, but, uh, so I had that experience many years ago. I was doing a, an on-site assessment. We had to be after hours because of the sensitivity of the organization, and we had to go, th- you know, show up at a certain time. You know, show our credentials at the front desk security. Get you know, we had to show that we we're demonst- You know, we we're allowed to be here. There's two things that happened on this one particular engagement. The first was we were there for a week. The last day, we're we're there showing up, checking in. Somebody walked in while we were at the security desk and said, "Hey, my wife works here, and uh, she's she's at the you know." She, she's a member of the credit union for the organization. Is it still downstairs? I want to go there. And they're like, oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm like, shit, all we had to do to get in was just say, can we go to the credit union? That was one thing. The other thing, we was there, we were there. The other thing is you could have showed up with flowers and been like. There were so yeah, many ways. Yeah, so many ways. And, 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 yeah, that's a whole different. I love the, phys- the physical stuff. The is physical all, security yeah, is a whole different topic. Whole different but thing. the other thing was like we were. You know, after hours, we were on site. We were in a particular place, and and the guy I, I was more the project lead. The the guys I was with, they were doing some stuff, and I was just kind of milling about. Oh, let's just walk up and down, and you know, take a look at the office. And I'm like looking in closets, and you know, is this door open? What's in here? Type of stuff. And a security guy was making his rounds while I was like in a closet. Opening a door. Yeah, in a closet. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, "Hey, how you doing?" I'm like, "Hey, I'm doing okay." <laughs> just kept going. I'm yeah, like, that's it. What's the point? Right. Um, is Tyler still Where is Tyler? I Tyler's can't still. see Tyler. It's driving me insane. Oh, okay. okay. Tyler had dropped. <laughs> but the point being, um, <laughs> if you if you approach the, an article like this and think, "Oh, this is all I need to do and I'm done." you're not done and you're actually setting yourself up for a breach right well and 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 it, it's worse than that jeff you know you went out and bought all the sexy products today but did you remember to factor in life cycling and when they're not so sexy and current are you still running that old norton antivirus notice i use the word norton wow norton. <laughs> oh wow we're coming well, back to the point. internet uh, let's go back even further it was <laughs> dr norton <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, back in the days when you, you could actually like read an entire drive because it was only like eight gigabytes, or or but, clam but this is, 1.0. But you know, in in the vendor space, very a, a very common term that's thrown around is solution, and I cringe every time I hear the <laughs> the word solution because it implies use this and you're done, and you don't have to right. worry about it. I, I try to always very deliberately say it's a tool, it's an application. It, mm-hmm. it, it's there are no. You say solutions. what it is, yeah. There are no solutions. Can I say right. that more clearly? There are no solutions. There are no te- technology solutions out there that you can just run it and you're done and you don't have to think about it. I want to just hop on the supply chain thing for a moment mm-hmm. in my story number twenty-seven. So I've been like really thinking about categorizing these style attacks, right? It's interesting. If you, if you Google search like supply chain something, right? oftentimes you get like, oh, like the Red Cross needs to make sure they have enough bandages in their supply chain, right? <laughs> and that's like, and then you get like software supply chain stuff, which is like you're developing software. Right. And so you start thinking about all these different scenarios. So I start... I start putting these in buckets. I'm like, Heartbleed, Log4J, 
mm -hmm. a, the Apache uh, one that just came out. Like that's a like I I I tend to use log for as example. There's a vulnerability right. in a piece of software that's in your supply chain, right? Then I start categorizing solar winds. Like there's a backdoor that someone put there mm -hmm. on purpose that's in software that's in your supply chain, right? And then I start categorizing like the harder things, which are drivers that we talked about. And I'm like, mm -hmm. there's a driver that's in your supply chain, but it's not necessarily a vulnerability. It's not a backdoor, but it has functionality that attackers are abusing to, to gain privileges. Get to that. Yeah. To me, that's, a, that's another thing, right? The thing that's also different for me is certificates in like signing. That's like a different mm -hmm. supply. Cause like, to me, something that's been signed or has a cryptographic signature, it's not a, it's not a software bug. It's not a back door, right? It's a feature. It, it, it's yeah. certificates have, it, it is not unintended functionality of software. It's a cryptographic signing process that in the supply chain has been like messed with, right? Mm -hmm. in, in what, what really like, like gets me that's amazing is when, again, you go from pushing the power button to login screen in your computer. And I start in my research for my day job thinking about all the certificates and signing this involved, like your microcode and your processor at the lowest right. levels. There's, there's actually certificates in your processor that's validating microcode updates that goes up through Intel ME, which is involved in some of the signing processes that speak to Intel boot guard that works mm -hmm. its way up to secure boot, which has its own certificate process, which also yeah. separate from that is the signing process for your UEFI or BIOS, uh, uh, the mm -hmm. capsule. So BIOS manufacturers will put a capsule around your BIOS update. That's a separate, that's not secure boot. That's validating mm -hmm. that. That's a separate certificate. That's, that's like, a, that's is <laughs> the BIOS update I'm applying like, does that pass a cryptographic hash that's not stored in the TPM, that's not stored as part mm -hmm. of secure boot because it's not part of the boot process. It's the mm -hmm. firmware that's being applied to update your BIOS. And this capsule is of validating that the BIOS update has been signed. Is this BIOS update really coming from Lenovo, IBM, Dell, HP, MSI, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So those are all different. Right. To me, that's like a, it's a different thing in the supply chain to go, someone leaked a key somewhere right like in and again this is all it's it's that it depends t-shirt that i talk about right like it yeah. depends <laughs> like you know like sometimes like there's a public key that's included and only shit signed with the private key mm -hmm. can be applied because there's a public key somewhere like and it's all implemented differently to me totally different supply chain there was uh this company called Jetstack that uh -huh. announced an open source tool for container image security that specifically is looking at the certificate supply, basically the certificate supply chain, right? Because in the certificate supply chain, like RSA is an, is an amazing, again, Steve Levy's like crypto book, like makes you realize like how amazing, first of all, Diffie-Hellman algorithm, right? <laughs> Secondly, RSA and like what- Until what they, quantum comes along. Until quantum comes along, but RSA, and the amazing things that came from that, right? And what uh, Jetstack is promoting with Paranoia is they're gonna look at like what certificates are in your containers and should they be trusted or not? And I'm like, to me, this is like <laughs> a really different friggin' good supply chain thing. Like I had this problem in one of my containers I was building and like it wasn't where it was a web, I think it was a web server and it, was, it wasn't working and I'm like, I don't know why, like, I can't get the, all the SSL stuff to work. Like, it's just not working. And John Kinsella, one of our hosts on application security, was like, Paul, did you include CA certificates when you were building that container? I'm like, no. He's like, dude, that's your problem. I'm like, oh, so basically I have to blindly <laughs> trust that whatever distribution is building my container is yes. giving me a list of <laughs> CA certificates that's like, hey, anything that's signed from these CAs, you should trust. And I'm like, oh, cool. Like, I'll just totally <laughs> blindly trust that. I won't validate it. And this project nope. is basically validating that for your containers. I'm like, that's, that's kind of cool. But hey, it solves your problem. Solved my problem. Well. It works. But again... <laughs> 
like we go back we talk about zero trust as a buzzword supply chain to me is, is kind of a buzzword right but it's all like this extension of trust and to me these tools are really valuable they help me evaluate like should i be trusting that certificate should i be trusting that process that's like mm -hmm. hey that hash of that binary means that it wasn't signed with this certificate right and there's like a lot of math and right. cryptography that goes behind all these and all these different processes oh, yeah. are different right mm -hmm. like it but it all comes down to should i trust that software like all the certificates the hashes keys all that stuff is basically validating should i trust that software th that's the first question the second question is how do you, how do you validate that how do, how do you answer the question it's up to you to that's what amazes but that, me but about that's the, what's it's Dice, what it, dicey about the cloud is who, who, who's responsible it, for validating all that so dicey well, right like because it's up to you like the whole thing like with let's just take open source software with mm -hmm. linux right like yeah they go like wait i'm gonna revoke that certificate or i'm gonna give you the software update and i'm gonna tell you should have that signature it's up to me to go validate that right oh. they could revoke something but I still have to validate that. Like someone has to update the revocation list. Some right. like you, it's on you as the end consumer mm -hmm. to go. I want to extend that validation. Like it, who's it, who's telling the end consumer they d they need to do that? Exactly. It's the, to me. It's the Spider Man meme. You ever see the Spider Man meme, which all the different yep. Spider Mans from the multiverses <laughs> and they're pointing at each other. Mm -hmm. That's yep. what I think of when you ask that question, Jeff. Every single time when someone asks me that question, I'm like. Yeah. It's the Spider-Man. We're all just pointing fingers at so, like, no, 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 it's Microsoft. No, no, it's, no, it's, it's almost Intel. like we need to have a whole, sh whole show focused on cloud security and right. informing, that would be huge. informing the public. You right. really need to be, you know, kicking the tires and, and asking these types of questions to your cloud provider. When because, I go online, because and I, don't think that because you've signed on with a cloud provider that they're doing all these things for you. When I go online and I look at people's questions about secure boot mm -hmm. and they're asking this question they're going so i'm applying the dbx update which is the revocation list for secure boot and whatever software they're using lvfs right fw up d uh manager right fw up d uh -huh. fw up d is telling me like look i'm not going to apply this revocation list because your bootloader has a, a hash or signature that's mm -hmm. in the revocation list that you're about to apply, which means if you have secure boot enabled, the next time you reboot, secure boot's gonna kick in. It's gonna go, your bootloader has a hash that's in my revocation list. Therefore, I can't boot your system. It's preempting that and going, you need to update your software first, otherwise your <laughs> system's not gonna boot. A boot. And the <laughs> users ask the question like, they're like, I don't understand why I'm getting this error. And I'm like, dude, I don't blame you. This shit is complex. To, like, it took me a really long time to understand this. Like, I had to go read a, a bunch of, of shit research. and talk oh, to yeah. my coworkers and make sure I understood this stuff. And I, I, I feel bad. And I go reply to these users and I explain it to them online. Like, I literally take it upon myself to go. Anyone asking that question, like, dude, I, I want to help you. And I explain it to them. And they still don't understand it because it's freaking complex to understand what like everything i just laid out unless like i have well, i've afforded the luxury of my day job where i get to spend time understanding this stuff not everyone has that luxury like it's not easy right. to understand and, and, and like, a, what, but the software is telling you like your shit's not gonna boot because you shouldn't trust the bootloader on your system like it's mind-blowing so so it's even more insidious than that paul you've got to under and this i don't think most people think about that you've got that signed uh rom that you're going to load in or a you know firmware but how what's what was the process used for issuing that certificate what's the integrity behind that signature oh well, that's a whole different um, rabbit did, hole, did right? somebody just yeah. slip 20 bucks under the door or did there was yeah. a uh, was there an id validation yeah microsoft um, was like yeah which, which we'll, of the, which we'll of give the, you a, we'll, we'll we'll validate the process so that bootloader is totally good which of the four ways to achieve comprehensive security does this fall under um ooh this is this I'm is biased. trust man this is like tr God. like do i like the whole question that i have like being a linux user working Managing for a firmware risk. company and like evaluating this process for yeah. things like secure boot things like validating 
firmware updates. The question that I always come back to, like at its core and pretty much a high level is, do I trust the software that's running on my system? So it's a zero trust question. Zero trust again is kind of like a a, 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 a buzzword. Forget the buzzword, almost, but what is what's the essence of what is intended by people that talk about zero trust seriously? It's a trust issue. I guess zero right? trust implies like I don't trust anything that runs on my system unless I validated the process, right? right? I, I take it a so higher level. So how many level cloud up customers are validating all the stuff that the cloud provider is giving to them? In, in, I guess in my terms question of the building is. Blocks? How can I trust the software that's running on my system? As a better question, right? Zero trust might be an answer to that, mm -hmm. but the fundamental question in my mind is, how can I trust the software running on my system? Whether that's firmware, which is essentially software that's just inconvenient to program, quite frankly, <laughs> right? <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> is it my bootloader or kernel modules, which is lower level software, mm -hmm. which I have a tough time trusting because I really don't understand it. Like if you ever looked at bootloader code, kernel, kernel code, like it's really hard to understand. I think that gets, e for me, that gets easier. <coughs> Do I trust that library I've incorporated with my software? That I feel like I got a little more, my previous example in the segment, like I feel like I got a little more control over that but see now right. that you're like you're saying that right and i'm I'm sitting here i'm pondering i'm like these are serious questions like you know now i'm looking like okay do i really trust it, it makes you think <laughs> it like makes okay you question, do like, i need to go back yeah yeah it makes like, you question I... like all right okay i'm using this cloud provider okay what documents do you have in place that i need to read like uh, agreements and you know it, it kind of takes it down that rabbit hole like okay what are they really providing? Yeah, like they're SOC 2 compliant, man, which means they've answered a bunch of questions, basically. Right. Right? Like, does, I mean, that, mean, does, a, does that mean I trust them or not? There's a contract. There's a service level, level agreement. Right. There's small print that says what they do and what they don't, <coughs> don't do. And to, to the provider's credit, they say what they do and what they don't do. And the implication is if we're not doing it, it's still on you. How many companies are going that far to like think through all this? I I, I would question. Wage, I would wager not many. I, I hate to like wax philosophical, right? But like that's what we're doing. We are. We're we're we've emptied every bottle on the table. So how can you? <laughs> how can you really trust? How can you trust software? Like if you start following it down the rabbit hole, like how can I really trust that? Like it, it there's like. Breaking points. There's no way that you can. Right? Like you think of the debug, like this breaking point, like if you break points in any in the process, like someone lost a signing key. Someone, a developer got hacked. That's the hardest one. One of the hardest ones for me where the developer gets targeted and hacked. The developer abandons the software and someone else takes it over. How do I know uh -huh. that's happened? Right? Mm -hmm. Like there's all these really interesting and in, in do I trust and the I, software that I run? Right. And and here's the thing. And I know it's a lot to keep up with. So for me, when I'm trying to learn about like all the bugs that are going out there, like like all the bugs that are going on in specific applications, I join the developer's mailing list. Even if I never say anything, I yeah, just, just watch. Wonder. Yeah, watch what's going on. And watch what's going on. And it kind of helps me paint a picture so if I'm running across a software that says, oh, this is version 5.5 of like PHP, I'm just using that example. Oh, I've seen that bug somewhere before. Um, here's how it works because the developer explained it to me in the mailing list. Mm -hmm. You know, and just looking at it from, but here's the thing. If that developer, like you said, is no longer, and this is me thinking now, if that developer is no longer with the PHP team, right? Who takes that code over it? Yeah. Is he trustworthy? Will he tell me everything that's going on within that mailing list? Or is there something that he's holding back that he knows about that I don't know about? Or, and, do, or does or does he even does he even know? But it's that sliding does scale. You know like you if you extend yeah. my sliding scale of like Gen two as like the extreme <laughs> on the control of everything, like you're still even with Emerge. Gen two. Like you're, yeah, you're emerging, <laughs> but like you're compiling other people's software. You're not reviewing right. every line of code. You don't know the supply chain of every piece of code that you're compiling. Yeah, you're compiling it on your own. 
But you take that other end of the spectrum, your Apple M1, Charles. Like, yep. Apple put all that software together, firmware, drivers, right. all that stuff for you. You're implicitly trusting Apple. Like, is right. it is it better to trust one source because it no. limits your attack surface, or is it better to have more freedom to review? But maybe in that sense, you're trusting more people in Gen two because I'm taking this code from that repository, compiling it, taking that code from that repository i'm compiling it but you're trusting right. more people but in the other extreme i got a lot less freedom but i'm implicitly trusting right. apple it's so at the end at the end of the day right it all comes down to question everything mm -hmm. and continue questioning everything and if it takes you to go down a rabbit hole until you find the answer that Puts you a little bit at ease, but not 100% at ease. It's trust but verify. And how deep does that right. verification go, Charles? Right? Like, how, how deep does it's it go? It's a rabbit. Man? It's a yeah. rabbit hole. It, it's a never ending loop. Yeah. Because it's the king. It's just like, it's just like, take a house, for example, right? For a house, you always got to keep maintaining it. You got to know what's going on with your taxes. You have to know how much the taxes are. Um, you're pretty much going to keep a record of how much the taxes were the year before so you know the percentage increase and that tells you when you might have to sell that house or whatever because you can no longer keep up with the taxes because you know you see the endless loop here right you're not just saying hey just because it was five dollars this year i'm trusting that it's going to be five dollars next year if that makes sense no it makes sense yeah you I know so uh, yeah I, th I think there's some technical debt that that plays into it too and how yeah. often the software is updated and, and, and things like that as well. But, I, I, but it gets right. down to, I mean, going back to those four essential things to, to maintain, you know, to achieve security, I think it gets more to managing risk. Making an, mm -hmm. you know, being aware that these are the things and knowing that that's a possibility, then you apply a risk equation. What's the likelihood that somebody's going to mm -hmm. actually do this? What's the likelihood that somebody's going to come after me and target me? versus what's the likelihood that I'm I'm a, a likely target for the, all the attackers out there that are just looking for a target of opportunity. Um, you know, security ultimately is not achieving a state of being impenetrable. It's It's getting to the point where you know what the problems are, you know what you've sort of, okay, we've made this trust decision there's things that could happen, but we're going to use it because everybody's using it. It's the you know it's the best thing available. Mm. It's the most cost effective thing available. I, to me, it's a, it's a matter of just making an informed decision. Yes, I'm going to use it, but I know that certain things could happen. And then it boils down to how do you monitor and detect if somebody does try to exploit and and take advantage of the inherent inherited vulnerabilities yeah. and risks that you've assumed because you have to as a pragmatic I think that's a safety economical net, right? sense. The safety net is I gotta look at behavior and I gotta look at the network traffic. I gotta look at the telemetry from my And the bottom line right? is you just buy a good cyber insurance policy and you're done. Nah. <laughs> we're never done. No, it's we're, never we're, done. Never, we're never done. We're, we're never, never done. done. But I think there is a safety net aspect of it in that Yeah. I, I can get I, I get software from wherever, whether it's the extremes of Gen two or Apple, <laughs> like like multiple suppliers versus one supplier, right? That, mm -hmm. that is in control of that, right? I think you always need that safety net of behavior monitoring, of mm -hmm. looking at your logs, of just determining what's normal and what's not is your safety net, right? Right. I think when we go into the protection aspect of it. It tends right. to get different. Like, how do how do I look at software and know what I trust and know what I don't? And do I trust one and vendor? And I think most organizations aren't doing that. No. Period. No. Uh -huh. These are these are really philosophical debates that I don't think are making it up right. to most organizations cybersecurity are like, in a lot of organizations. Right. I'm like, going to use this because everybody's using this, and Gartner says it's okay to use it. And he so, said a buzzword. Uh, so I'm good. I did say a buzzword, and and I'll go on record. I think Gartner's the biggest scam in the industry. Uh, so they'll never. You're be not a alone sponsor. in that thought, sir. 
<laughs> but, but you know, and, and Charles, to catch you up, I, I'm of the opinion of, and I've been in this this business for 40 years, mm-hmm. um, you know, as a pen tester and 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 beyond. But the way that most organizations are exploited to this day, and it was true 30, 40 years ago, is uh-huh. is weak passwords mm-hmm. and exploitation of trust, and that takes. That's you mean multifaceted, not, but not and not I, lasers that kill cockroaches. Not lasers that kill. You want to end on that story? <laughs> I do. I think you do, but but you know, the the trust issue. But you know, pragmatically, from an economic perspective, you have to make that trust decision. The to me, the best thing you can do is make an informed decision. Know mm-hmm. what you're 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 signing up for when you when you make that trust decision i'm going to use this at least know what the possibilities are and hopefully know what to look for in case of if somebody is going to try to exploit this if if somebody's going to try to do something to it this is what you look for to me the essence of security at the end of the day is you do all these things but at the end of the day you've got somebody or a group or an organization that's saying not on my watch and they Uh know what to look for to try to detect if somebody was trying to exploit. I want to add one more point onto that. In that, sure. I think it's interesting to think about choosing hardware and software that's going to get support for a really long time, because support means they may support security updates for a really long time. And some of the like difficult situations we get into are with that legacy right. hardware and software, where a hardware and or software vendor has gone. I'm not going to support that, right? Like it's Windows XP embedded, and that puts you in a really horrible place. Where I see this coming to fruition... It does or it doesn't. But an article that I saw this week is kind of interesting Mm -hmm. in that when we look at UEFI firmware, Mm -hmm. uh, Coreboot is supporting... So Coreboot is open source UEFI firmware. Coreboot supporting MSI motherboards, right? right? And some of the newer motherboards that are like DDR5, like latest gen Intel stuff, to me, that's encouraging because MSI kind of has this reputation. My laptop that's sitting in front of me is an example that only provides updates and support <laughs> for a limited amount of time, like mm-hmm. two years, and they're done. They make great hardware. Their hardware is amazing and reasonably priced, but their support is pretty short. But if open source can step in and go, we're going to support that hardware, and we're going to support it for pretty like a really long time and if there's a security update we're going to apply it beyond two years up to five years up to 10 years even that up those updates are really valuable in terms of being able to secure my hardware and software right so i think there's a there's an aspect of that i'm excited about like in my next build i would use msi because core boot's supporting it and they're probably going to support it for a really long time and it and I'm thinking if there's a heinous security vulnerability in SMM call out and UEFI, they're gonna be like, oh, we'll just, we'll fix that. We'll fix that for you. Whereas MSI is like, we produced three more boards <laughs> since then. And they're like, <laughs> you know, we're done because of, you know, corporate, we got to meet our bottom line kind of thing. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think that's, I think that is. But that begs the question, you know, and we talked about it off air earlier, and I won't name names, but the, the, the idea that just because a vulnerability exists, is it really a vulnerability? Does it need, does it really need to be addressed? Is there a threat going after it? Is there a threat trying to exploit it? Is is there somebody going after you, trying to target that particular vulnerability? I think it, once it reaches to the point that we're talking about it, because we didn't talk about the open SSL vulnerability mm-hmm. that affects version 3.0 and later and is a remote code execution vulnerability. I didn't add that to my stories. It came in late, but right. um, that is out there. Next Tuesday, we'll get more information, so we'll cover it next week um, as well. But I, I, I think at the end of the day, it kind of comes back to when we used to work in vulnerability management, Jeff. Mm-hmm. Like, just patch it. Like, seriously, just <laughs> like, you know about it. Like, just patch it. Like, the, the cost of patching outweighs the risk of, the bad things that could happen if you don't patch it, right? Um, like the um, operational unless, risk unless, versus security. Unless risk. the organization isn't mature enough to to know, know that habit. that's true, true, and they're and they're they've they've bought into that. Well, we can't patch it because it's going to break mm. 
our app or it's going to break this that or the other which has been an a, an argument for 30 years mm -hmm. that i've been involved we can't update we can't patch because it's going to break something right yeah that's anyway let's talk about cockroaches all right let's call, let's 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 a closing end on note, a lighter like, note of cockroaches so scientists <laughs> have tested an intelligent robot laser to kill cockroaches i just want to say like I don't trust computers at this point in time to determine if a if it's a cockroach that should be killed dead with a laser or it's my foot or it's my eyeball. <laughs> like I really don't. Like <laughs> humans write software and we all know as we've established in this segment software has bugs and I just don't trust it. Trust it. Like I'm a human and when the thing asks me to identify fire hydrants like, sometimes I get that shit wrong. But we're saying computers should distinguish between a cockroach <laughs> and my eyeball or my, my toe. My, like my big toe. Is that a cockroach? Or is that Paul's big toe? Like, I could be missing a big toe because the AI misidentified <laughs> that. As a human, I feel like I'm far superior to AI in identifying things. And I get that shit wrong when they're like, is that a crosswalk? I'm like, or a motorcycle? I'm like... Fuck, I don't know. Is that a crosswalk? I don't I, like I may have missed a square in in that thing that tells you it, like the computer's asking me if I'm a robot or not. I'm like, who are you? You you're a robot. What what is going on right now? It's the endless loop that doesn't have a control C option. Yep. Oh, <laughs> and the the captures sometimes get out of control. Out of control. Yep. And for that reason I don't trust a laser that's using AI to determine whether it's a cockroach or one of my body parts, let's put it that way. Like, don't burn off one of my body parts. But I don't trust it. I don't trust <laughs> it, man. I don't trust it. You know what? That hey, zero faith and depends, but it depends <laughs> on a T-shirt. I don't know. <laughs> I think we like a, a new name for the next security company that we all create is called Zero Faith. <laughs> <laughs> right it's the it's next buzzword we need zero to start faith depends or yep. something like that right <laughs> zero faith. well oh thank you goodness. everyone that or zero fucks for listening and watching this edition of Paul security weekly over and out <laughs>